om de vertaling in het Nederlands te beluisteren, gelief het taalkanaal Chinees te selecteren. Bedankt. Gujarati Bhasha Ma Anuwaad Sambhadwa Maate Krupa Karine Japanese Bhasha Ni Channel Pasand Karo. Aabhaar. Marathi Bhasha Antara Karita Krupaya Korean Bhasha Channel Select Karave. Dhanyavad. A pleasant day, sisters and brothers. I am Emily Zanchua from Mahardika Lodge in Davao, Philippines, and I will be your host and moderator for the Indo-Pacific portion for the program today. We start off with an interesting presentation from Richard Sell. Richard comes from a Theosophical family in New Zealand and first joined Theosophical Society as a teenager. He is currently president of Auckland's HPB Lodge and is chair of the Governance Board of the New Zealand Section. Richard also holds an MBA. Richard is a passionate Theosophist who helps run the study program for his local lodge. He has presented throughout New Zealand as a national speaker, and he has presented internationally in Adyar, Indonesia, and the World Congress in Singapore. He contributes articles in Theosophical magazines, and he is also very active in promoting Theosophy as a founder of Theosophy World Resource website. Richard loves all things Theosophical but is especially interested in self-awareness and transformation process that is undertaken by the individual and how this can be actioned in today's difficult world. He is a history buff and theosophical history is near to his heart. So on that note, let us welcome Richard Sell with his presentation, Searching for Harmony. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. If you ask just about anyone whether they want peace and harmony in their lives, and if they desire that for their country and the planet too, the answer will inevitably be yes. Why is it therefore we have the opposite? Why is harmony so difficult to achieve? Somewhat like climate change, where we all want a green planet and clean blue seas, what we get is polluted skies, choked waterways and increased disasters. These so-called natural disasters have their root cause in the mind of humanity. It makes one stop and think about things. The COVID pandemic, for instance, has provided this opportunity for us so vividly, presenting a window for the further development of humanity's discriminative faculty. For example, we hear statements like, no one is safe until we were all safe. This is a recognition of our universal unity. Being able to think in a new way and form a new and more inclusive worldview is something that will hopefully come out from this intensive period. 
As Albert Einstein said, problems cannot be solved on the same level that they were created. I have given deep thought to the workings of harmony for some time and why humanity is not doing well on this scorecard. So today I'd like to take a, a closer look at some of the different aspects of harmony, being science, karma and our own personal attitude and subsequent approach to this important matter. Hopefully an analysis of these will shed a little more light on this topic which, from which we can then act. If we don't act, then nothing much is gained beyond idle curiosity satisfied in a few hours wild away. So what is it when we speak of harmony? Harmony is essentially a relationship in which various components exist together without destroying one another. What might these components be? Well, they could be anything really. Nikola Tesla spoke of some fundamental aspects of harmony, though when he wrote, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. Thinking about music helps us understand this concept better. We have all heard the discord of multiple instruments, for example, when a symphony orchestra warms up before playing. Then shortly afterwards, sublime vibrations fill the airwaves, bringing coherently together those previously discordant notes and chords into what we call harmony. They did not destroy the previous notes, but brought them together in a more pleasing and uplifting sound that speaks to something deeper inside us. You may have seen the scientific experiments when sand is poured onto a piece of paper and a pure note is struck, thus forming beautiful mathematical patterns. We did some experiments like this at my own Theosophical Centre a few years ago, looking at the patterns of various tones made from a cello, when it was plucked and drawn with a bow. These were quite varied and fascinating. I'm sure you've all heard of Dr. Emoto's experiments with water, where he demonstrates how it reacts and changes depending on the thoughts, sounds and intention sent towards it. When thoughts of love, benevolence and compassion were directed towards the water, the results were aesthetically pleasing via the physical mo molecule formations in the water. While water exposed to fearful and discordant human intentions result in disconnected, disfigured and unpleasant physical molecular formations. He did this through magnetic resonance analysis technology and high-speed photography. You can, you can see on these slides love and gratitude and then what happens if you have negative intent? You disgust me. You can look at the way the word evil sounds with the water and then the positive thank you. Music also has its own influence on the water crystals. At the bottom, you can see Mozart's Symphony No. 40 versus the heavy metal music. And look at the beautiful arrangement with the words eternal and peace. And the next image down is water before and after a Buddhist prayer was said at Fujiwara Dam in Japan. Austrian engineer Bernard Ruffhauser building on Dr. Omoto's work, built a device that restructures water molecules and assists water in being its highest vibration as living energy. When water passes through the UH device, he says everything life supporting in the water is enhanced, energy increases, memory is erased and toxins are energetically neutralized. The last photos are the, of the water that passed through the device using the Emoto protocol and demonstrates how inherent spring water quality is restored. Rathhauser says you can see how the water after passing through the device results in a significant improvement in crystalline structure. Returning to music again for a moment, H.P. Blavatsky mentions an Isis unveiled that the ancient Egyptians cultivated the musical arts too and understood well the effects of mus musical harmony and its influence on the human spirit. She says, 
we can find on the older scriptures and carvings scenes in which musicians play on various instruments. Music was used in the healing department of the temples for the cure of nervous disorders. Maybe this will become more widespread in future years in the treatment of illness as health practitioners become more holistic in their approach. The universe is built on harmonies and the Pythagoreans had it right when they married mathematics, music and the cosmos together. More than 2,500 years ago, according to ancient sources, Pythagoras applied his discoveries in music theory to the behaviour of the celestial objects. Pluck a string and the pitch of the note produced is related to the length of the string. When the lengths of two strings are a simple ratio, such as a half or two thirds and so on, the notes together sound harmonious. Pythagoras believed that the universe itself hummed with, with its own harmony, beautiful, divine and inaudible to human ears. He characterised the intervals between successive orbits, such as those of Mercury and Venus, as either tones or half tones, the smallest intervals in the musical scale, adding up to seven whole tones that form a perfectly harmonious natural order. This tells us that to produce harmony, the right notes must be struck, the right vibrations and energy waves be released, as mentioned by Tesla. Harmony involves working with opposites. Dealing with opposing ideas and opposites can be difficult, and knowing what to fight, what to change, what to let go, is always the tricky part. Sometimes we go to the extreme and are not even sure how we got there. Previous international president N. Sri Ram said, a person who goes to an extreme will after some time tend to go to the extreme opposite. For example, those who induce courage by self-suggestion or by putting on an exaggerated brave front are really just creating a mask covering up fear. Or perhaps out of revulsion for some feature or disappointment in life, a person will rebound in the opposite direction. This may be result in fanatical behaviour or just be unhealthy. Perhaps the person brought up in an overly religious family may become an atheist. The person brought up in a household with violence as a child may swing in the opposite direction, imposing little restrictions or boundaries on their own children which introduces its own problems. The middle ground is what is missing here. The Buddha spoke to us of the middle way or the middle path. This is a place of balance where harmony is sure to be found if we but seek it. Nature is built on opposites which are always intertwined but it keeps the balance between the two equally. Think day and night, the four seasons. As decay through old age occurs, or the leaves fall in their right seasons, there is also a coming renewal of life, and new growth and beginnings. So the struggle of life and death of passing seasons is held in nature's hand, malleable and changing, but always coming back to the balance, that state where the various components exist together without destroying one another. It is in skillfully dealing with these polarities and often changing forces in our life that we learn to become more harmonious with others and with our own being. These struggles all present opportunities for growth. One of the easiest ways to see harmony at work is through the great law of karma. Karma is the harmonizing force of the universe. It is the adjuster, the equalizer that restores broken harmony. It plays out on a wide stage, rebalancing at different levels. We can see in action world karma, such as world wars, climate change and pandemics. This is the broad brush, sweeping up millions in its effect. National karma is adjusted through smaller wars or, na or national, national natural disasters, but can also be favourable in nature to some nations and we see this star of ascendancy rising in world affairs. Of course, the karmic aspect most focused upon is personal karma, which is so instructive, but difficult to bear at times as well. 
our actions and emotions and thoughts create energy and therefore affect. HPP tells us how karma works in a scientific sense as the great law of the universe. This is a very good explanation. She says, think now of a pond. A stone falls into the water and creates disturbing waves. These waves oscillate backwards and forwards until at last, owing to the operation of what physicists call the law of dissipation of energy, they are brought to rest and the water returns to its condition of calm tranquillity. Similarly, all action on every plane produces disturbances in the balanced harmony of the universe and the vibrations so produced will continue to roll backwards and forwards if its area is limited, till equilibrium is restored. But since each disturbance starts from some particular point, it is clear that equilibrium and harmony can only be restored by the reconverging to that same point of all the forces which were set in motion from it. And here you have the proof that the consequences of a man's deeds, thoughts, etc., must all react upon himself with the same force with which they were set in motion. If harmony is disrupted through our thoughts and deeds, and we know that karma is created because of this, we would be wise to observe ourselves closely and make a study of our actions and motives. In the key to theosophy, it describes karma as that law of readjustment which ever tends to restore disturbed equilibrium in the physical and broken harmony in the moral world. We say that karma does not act in this or that particular way always, but that it always does act so as to restore harmony and preserve the balance of equilibrium and virtue of what the universe exists. The key also says that good and harmony and evil and disharmony are synonymous Madame Blavatsky writes, we maintain that all pain and suffering are results of want of harmony and that the one terrible and only cause of the disturbance of harmony is selfishness in some form or another. We see from this that we, we reap the full consequences of our actions, having to atone for suffering we have caused, but equally reaping in joy and gladness the fruits of all the happiness and harmony we help produce. Also note, Madame Blavatsky says, the only cause of the disturbance of harmony is selfishness. This word selfishness comes up time and time again in theosophical literature. It seems to be that the root of most of the world's pain lies in selfishness. That is plain to see, but what can be done about it? What causes it? What are the main attributes of selfishness and why do they exist? There seems to me to be three reasons, three main causes of selfishness. Firstly, from my own studies and experience, there are those who want to control others and events as they unfold. Why is this? Because we want to feel safe instead of being afraid of the unknown or feeling vulnerable like someone lost in the dark. Control is the light switch, but this comes with ramifications of the growing stronger of what is called ahamkara, or the little I, and results in the building up of the personality, the small ego. We also attract the karmic consequences of our actions towards others, which have to be met with at some time in the future, this life or another one, but an inescapable meeting nonetheless. Jeffrey Hodson shows a way out of this folly of caring too much about the small self, the personality. He says, the part of us which suffers is ahamkara, the sense of I-ness, of I amness, the delusion of separated self-personality. We can get rid of this in an utter surrender to the one will and a complete impersonality which literally does not care about the self then pain on our own account cannot touch us. Personal accusations and affronts, injustices, gossiping will cause us not one moment of personal sorrow. He who has sacrificed self has found the way to peace. 
The twin part to this control aspect of people is wanting to achieve certain outcomes, to make the results known in one's favour or to one's benefit. We may grow frustrated when the world doesn't behave the way we think it should and our lives don't conform to our expectations. Rather than feeling frustrated, we could let go. Life, in fact, is a long practice of letting go. The Bhagavad Gita provides sound advice here. It tells us, when actions are performed, renouncing attachment and desire for the fruits of action, one becomes equal to gain and loss and experiences sameness, for which is yoga itself. Sameness meaning neither happy nor sad at happenings and results. It is in this attitude of non-attachment to outcomes and by doing right actions with the right intent that we begin to live life in a way that we do not attract karma to ourselves, both good or bad, for each holds us firmly in the grip of cause and effect which ties us to the wheel of rebirth. The second key reason for selfishness is desire. We want money, prestige, status, power, respect, grand housing and other trinkets of daily living. Grasping in this way does not usually satisfy us once achieved. We want more even though we still feel empty and unfulfilled. The Buddha's teaching, the Four Noble Truth, speaks of this desire and it being the cause of human suffering. He says, this is based on temporary and conditional states of being. The Buddha shows us the way to move beyond this state towards enlightenment through the Eightfold Noble Path. In this, the first step of the Eightfold Noble Path is right understanding or right view. And this is most vital to the seeker. How we see the world is based on many things. These are largely to do with conditioning from religion, culture, schooling, parents and society at large, and so forth. Combined, these factors mould what may be called our world view. Having a wide view, an open mind, is very important to the student treading the razor-edged path. The third reason is one to do with evolution and the unfoldment of consciousness itself. There are two broad paths, one called the path of forthgoing and the other the path of return. On the path of forthgoing, Dr. Annie Besant said that human beings are surrounded by, on every side by objects of desire and to use these is to evoke the desire to possess them, to stimulate exertion, to inspire efforts and thus to make faculty, capacity, strength, intelligence, alertness, judgment, perseverance, patience and fortitude. Through learning, the desires will become more subtle and more refined as intelligence fashions them, and emotions replace passions. But throughout the treading of the path of forthgoing, the desire for fruit is the necessary and blameless motive for exertion. Without this, the man or woman at the stage of evolution becomes lethargic and does not evolve. However, when we start treading the path of return, call it what you will, the path back to the source, the one, God, the higher self, these lower aspects of the attributes must be transformed into something higher. For example, greed can be transformed into altruism, pride into modesty. Understanding how we want to live our lives using right understanding and the other modes of living as taught by Buddha leads us to consider what values and ethics we then want to live by. There are three main types of values. There are core values, or might be called universal values. These are enduring, time-tested, and apply to all cultures and times. They cover things like truth, love, peace, non-violence, universal brotherhood and sisterhood, selflessness, kindness, compassion, etc. The second type of values are cultural values. These are based on social norms, religious and cultural traditions and beliefs, etc. They might cover aspects like religious expression, material comfort, rule of law, 
ideas of social justice, etc. Things we all think of generally in a collective way in our culture. And the third are personal values. These are based on personal preferences, temperaments, vocations and talents, etc. So we might see things like a sense of loyalty and integrity, respect for self and others, our personal code of conduct, morality, and things like diet and hygiene also. True fulfillment and meaning in life require that personal and cultural values must be in harmony with universal values. Now that we have our values worked out and hopefully a wider view on what life is about and what we want to achieve on a personal transformative level through right understanding, we begin the hard work of transforming the lower nature into something higher. This is a direct act of harmonising one's life. So for example, we transform fear into courage, unbalance into poise, individualism into cooperation and so forth. The trick here is not to fight or dwell on the negative side as that will only give it power and energy and make it stronger. The best method is to ignore the negative side and focus on the opposite trait, the positive aspects. In the Dhamma part of the Buddha says, hate never yet dispelled hate, only love dispels hate. This is the law, ancient and inexhaustible. So by making the positive traits stronger, they become a habit and eventually a part of one's character. It becomes who we are. This can be done just not once, but many lifetimes work, and it takes much effort and attention. Underlying all of this is ethics. HPB herself said that theosophy is essentially high ethics. We have ample guidance in this department to help understand what is meant here. And the key to theosophy opposes the question, have you any ethical system that you carry out in the society? And the theosophist answers, the ethics are there, ready and clear enough for whosoever would follow them. They are the essence and cream of the world's ethics, gathered from the teachings of all the world's great reformers. Therefore you'll find represented therein Confucius and Zoroaster, Lhatse and the Bhagavad Gita, the precepts of Gautama Buddha and Jesus of Nazareth, of Halal and his school, as of Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato and their schools. HPB's Golden Stairs is a fine example of living one's life with high ethics. Making these a living presence in our life leads towards a happy and harmonious life. Again, this is not easy at first. We don't live in a cave. We have to interact with the world at large and people in it. Here resides conflict and interpersonal relationships. There is a certain need for discord because as human beings we learn by meeting with adversity and yes even conflict. These seem to be necessary steps in our unfoldment and by the way in which we meet these circumstances and react we make either good or bad karma. Importantly we learn and grow, some more quickly than others, but all troubles on the path are gains. Geoffrey Hodgson said to welcome the storms of life and the storm bringers. He wrote, Everest cannot be climbed without either. A blow is required to cause the spark to leap out of the flint. Their depth is fashioned from the man under the hammer of Thor. We should not always judge our misfortunes too harshly either. The writer Alan Watts said, so what is discord at one level of your being is harmony at another. An illness, bad on one level, may in fact be the out, final outworking of karma from some other life, and now restorative harmony is close at hand and will allow the person to move forward in this life, this being the harmony restored at another level. We might think that discord and conflict arises from evil, is there such a thing? In the well-known Mahatma letters, Master Kathuma said that evil has no existence per se. He wrote, It is the absence of good, and it is perceived as evil only by its victims. Nature in itself is neither good nor evil. 
she follows only immutable laws, the blind laws of necessity, and hence is not evil. Real evil proceeds from human intelligence, and its origin rests entirely with reasoning man, who disassociates himself from nature. Humanity then alone is the true source of evil. This again suggests what we term as evil is really disharmony, someone disassociating themselves from nature and natural law. If we take a look at opposing forces from another viewpoint, we see that they are in fact perennial forces to be contended with. At the close of the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in America, Benjamin Franklin was queried as he left Independence Hall on the final day of deliberation. In the notes of James McHenry, one of Maryland's delegates to the convention, a lady asked Dr. Franklin, Well, Doctor, what have we got? A monarchy or a republic? Dr. Franklin replied, A republic, if you can keep it. We can see by this warning that opposing forces are ever present. The struggle must be fought and re-fought. We also know these things come in ways because all things are cyclical in nature and the universe. This is one of the core tenets of theosophy. We have good times leading to bad times and bad times leading to good times. When forces of disharmony become too great, forces of harmony are stepped up a gear. Humanity collectively pushes back on intolerance and controlling forces. This was very clear in the world wars of the 20th century. But note, some differences how society treated those not cooperating with national war efforts. In some countries, conscientious objectors were fined or went to jail. In others, they were shot. The difference? A more tolerant society in one state. The condition of a society or nation finds itself in comes directly from the inhabitants, many of who may reincarnate for several lives in a particular nation. The slow change in society will therefore occur as each person transforms himself, and in doing so, they transform society. So what is our personal approach? We now have some fundamental basics on harmony, and how can this be achieved on a personal level? We live in this world of external disharmony, so how do we negotiate through it, especially when so much is confusing? The suggestions in theosophical literature can seem to be at odds as well. Let's take a closer look at some situations that we may all face. What to do if someone insults or attacks you? Jeffrey Hodson says in his book, The Initiate Life. The true occultist never defends himself. There is no need of self-defense. For the righteous, for truth is bound to prevail. Right to be victorious in the end, the occultist is content to rest upon that law. Okay, that message is pretty clear. Suppose now that we see someone else being set upon, not ourselves. In HPB's Golden Stairs we read, A valiant defence of those unjustly attacked. Another clear message heard, We should do something in their defence. What if, however, you hold a position in an organisation, say a business or a school, that has been undermined through personal attacks on you or your position? Not defending oneself is okay, but then one should defend the people you work alongside and the structures of the organisation you work for, assuming they are fair and reasonable. This puts the theosophist into a bit of a quandary as to what to do, defend or not defend. Well, each must decide for themselves based upon their values and ethics. We should have by now settled upon a brave declaration of principles, as stated in the Golden Stairs. To leave things alone, hoping harmony will be restored, is this right or wrong? Perhaps harmony cannot be restored without some sort of action. Another piece of guidance on how to act is duty. One's duty also features a lot in some theosophical literature, especially in the Mahatma letters to A.P. Sinnott. We do what we must 
and attend to what work is before us with our principles at the fore. In letter 43, it says, Realise, my friend, that the social affections have little, if any, control over any true adept of the performance of his duty. In proportion, as he rises towards perfect adeptship, the fancies and antipathies of his former self are weakened. He takes all mankind into his heart and regards them in mass. And again in the Mahatma letters we read, Does it seem to you a small thing that the past year has been spent only in your family duties? Nay, but what better cause for reward, what better discipline than the daily and hourly performance of duty? Believe me, my pupil, the man or woman who is placed by karma in the midst of small plain duties and sacrifices and loving kindness will through these faithfully fulfil rise to the larger measure of duty, sacrifice and charity to all humanity. Not worrying overly about the outcome of things or the fruits of action as seen in the Bhagavad Gita, we do our duty, that which is right and just. Wrestling with such matters as an individual concern, and we must all come to our own conclusions, hopefully after much thought and soul searching has been done as to what is the right course of action. Working in a spirit of cooperation and tolerance and goodwill is very important to achieving and maintaining harmony. The philosopher and writer Delia Steinberg Guzman said, those who are incapable of living in harmony with others are also incapable of living in harmony with themselves. What they can't achieve when working with others, they won't achieve for themselves either. We can see that right conduct in one's life, stemming from right understanding, brings about not only inner tranquility and peace, but also harmoniously external relationships. And what occurs outside us, ever increasingly, cannot disturb the inner poise gained. There is much strength in inner calm and poise, and this is a sure sign of progress. Geoffrey Hodson said in his diary, My life is an inconceivable slow apprenticeship for self-mastery for attainment. One seeks ever a stable centre of faultless wisdom an unfailing vision and utter steadfastness between and amidst happiness and pain. It is only through individuals achieving harmony within themselves that society can achieve harmony collectively. As collective harmony is restored, we will see social conditions change, wars lessen or cease, natural, natural disasters, nature's own way of restoring equilibrium and harmony will also lessen. From the macro viewpoint, this change in world affairs is over a much longer time scale. The time scale for personal development, however, is here and now. The famous sage Sri Ramana Maharishi said it well when he encouraged us to focus inwardly. He said, self-reform automatically brings about social reform. Confine yourself to self-reform social reform will take care of itself. He also said, first reform yourself and then it will be time enough to think about the world. How can you help the world until you have helped yourself? Indeed, how can the ignorant enlighten the ignorant? Our eyes must be open to comprehend our own personalities, thoughts, patterns and behaviours. In HPB's mystical book, Voice of the Silence, there is a line about this inner harmony. It says, Before the soul can see, the harmony within must be attained. On talks on the path of occultism about the voice, the commentary speaks about needing to purify the personality and harmonise it with the soul. The personality must be opened up and widened. Until this is done, the personality sees everything and everybody from its own limited and distorted view. Geoffrey Hodson in his diary tells us the personality is the barrier, the weakness, the Achilles heel and the source of failure. The adept in contrast 
has all their vehicles aligned in perfect harmony. Discords at any level can find no place whatever, no vibrating influence upon the life and on the mind of a master of the wisdom. Further along in the voice it talks about Shaila, which generally translates simply as conduct. And in this, HPB emphasizes the idea of harmony. Our theosophical concepts of right conduct go beyond the normal rules and conventions of society. We look to the principles of the spiritual life, which adheres to truth, love, and a life of service, leaving no room for personal self-indulgence. We are each the decreer of our own lives and what moral and ethical standards we will live our life by. One can imagine as one treads the path further along and our vista expands, these self-imposed rules do become more stringent, but most likely they feel right and we would no longer be chafing at them, but see them as naturally fitting our new modes of life. So the message in all this is quite clear. Look within, work upon yourself, and from Marcus Aurelius, he who lives in harmony with himself lives in harmony with the universe. So in summary, we have our topic in a nutshell. Harmony is the smooth flow of life, where we have established a balance between our inner world and the external world. It is a place we have, we have made peace with ourselves. True harmony is also founded upon karma, but this too has an end. Where the high arhat has outworked their adverse karma and paid their debts at every level to all life and to all living beings. In Mr. Hodson's diary, we read that harmony is the secret treasure, the priceless privilege of all who have utterly outgrown the errors of untruth and the discordance with which that is intimately involved. I've always admired the undisturbed yogis, facing favour or adversity with equal indifference. They have attained that inner poise, that harmony within, which any winds of fortune cannot disturb. Many years ago, I was in Australia talking with an older member of the society. We were just chatting about things theosophical in general on a warm autumn afternoon. He reminisced about when the international president in Sri Ram came to Australia many years earlier, and he asked Sri Ram, he said, with all the intrigues and petty squabbles going on in Adyar and elsewhere in the TS world, how do you cope with all that? Does it upset you? Sri Ram turned to him and quietly said, it's all just wind blowing in the leaves. I thought that this was a wonderful attitude to aspire to. Discord is all temporary, conditioned and unimportant. Let it go and don't let it take one away from the equipoise gained, the calmness in the centre of one's core being. I remind myself of Sri Ram's reply often when feeling disturbed. So work with the laws and forces of nature, not against them. The man in a boat who sets his sail so that he may go against the wind is not overcoming the wind, but is harmonising his affairs with nature's laws. In working with the laws of nature, the human being gains a wider understanding and is no longer fighting against the tide. And I'd like here to quote Colossians in the Bible, which says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together, a perfect harmony. I'll now finish with a small story that demonstrates what can happen when harmony is given a chance. On a rainy night of New Year's Eve, a lonely little girl was saddened by the disagreements that were brought upon her family members. The little girl sadly said, It's New Year's Eve, but it's been raining all day long. New Year is coming, but no one is in a good mood. Brother insists on buying a new bike. Dad, mum and brother are quarrelling about it again. Dad told brother, Can't you use the old bicycle? You just know how to spend money. Mother also said to brother, The economy is bad. Why don't you just use the old one? Brother angrily said, The old bike breaks down all the time. You can use it. I won't. 
It's your fault you have spoiled him, Dad shouted to Mum. The little girl asked herself, It's New Year, but why is everyone unhappy? Kitty, can you tell me how to make everyone happy for the New Year? asked the little girl sadly to her cat. Then outside the window, the little girl looked up and saw four old men were coming up the pathway. Dad, Mum, look, brother, come quick and see. Mum said to the old men, Ah, it's raining so heavily, sirs. Please come in for shelter. Old man one said, Ha ha, thank you for your kindness, ma'am. But we have a rule. Only one of the four of us can come in. Who do you want to invite in? The four old men then introduced themselves one by one. Old man two, I am wealth. Old man three, I am success. Old man four, I am well-being. Old man one said with a laugh, Ha ha, everyone calls me harmony. Dad said to the four old men, Surely we should invite in wealth, then we can have a comfortable life. Brother said, No, no, choose success. I want my family to be proud of me. Mum said, Wait a moment. I think well-being is the most important. Dad exclaimed wealth. Brother exclaimed success. Mum exclaimed well-being. The little girl asked her mother, Mum, Mum, what is harmony? Why don't you invite in harmony? Dad said, yes, you're right. Why don't we invite in harmony? New Year is here. We should be harmonious. Let's invite Mr Harmony in then. Seeing that all the four old men came in together, the little girl's father said, Hey, I thought you said only one of you can come in. Why did all of you come in? Old man one replied, Ha ha, we have another rule. If harmony enters, well-being, success and wealth will follow. The little girl happily said, Now I understand, to be happy is to be in harmony. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you very much, Richard, for that very interesting presentation. Indeed, to be happy is to be in harmony. Now, we have a few questions for Richard. The first question is, you say that right understanding is most vital to the seeker. Can you please elaborate on this? Well, that's an interesting question. It makes us ask, what is the purpose of life? We talk about the reincarnating ego putting itself down on the various planes of nature, like the physical and the emotional and the mental. And it's trying to get self-mastery of these planes through uh, the physical body and the psychological bodies. So it has to build these up, and it builds up the little self uh, to start with, otherwise it wouldn't survive this long journey. And this goes on for millions of years, and this was what I was talking about, the path of forthgoing. But when we come to the path of return, things have to change, and we have to actually uh, transform this lower nature. And this is quite a hard work of turning around uh, hundreds of lifetimes of work in one direction only. So we need to start with awareness. I think awareness is pretty critical here. This is our Buddhic nature starting to shine through. And we have to be awake. And what are we awake to? We're awake to our behaviours and how we're acting on this planet. And we might ask, who am I? And how am I behaving? My conduct? What are we actually trying to do? Well, we're trying to transform and purify our lower natures. It's a little bit like a, a roadmap. We need to, we can't just go there. We need to understand where we're going and how we get there. We don't just jump in our car and head off in a direction. No, we consult the map. And so our, our map is our probably our moral compass, again, coming from our, our Buddhic nature. If we don't have a moral compass, then any direction would do, any actions would do. And consider, uh, you ask yourself, what is morally ethical or right and you'll find someone else will disagree you might think well how can we both be right or wrong someone must be right and have the truth and so how we think is really important and we know that we're conditioned by our friends and family and we know that not much uh, thought is really original truly originally ours and it's important to use our discriminative faculty it's there's a lot of conflict in the world a lot of wars and disharmony and so we really need to be thinking with so much disinformation uh, on social networks out there 
And so we should be questioning what is in front of us and perhaps not accepting the same old answers that have been giving, given to us before. Now, whether this is um, for ourselves or humanity. So where do we put our efforts into? Well, character building is a really good place to start. So, for example, someone might come and shout at you and you might say, oh, how dare you? Well, where are we coming from? Are we saying that it's okay to shout at someone else, but just not me because I'm so important, I'm some sort of king or emperor? Ask yourself, would Mother Teresa or Mahatma Gandhi come back at people and say, do you know who I am? So there's a tinge of pride here, not humility. And so if we have awareness of this, then we can do something about it. And so right view is really important because it informs our conduct and our speech. So we have right speech. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it accurate? And this brings about self-responsibility and self-accountability. And these things are, are very hard to truly face ourselves and do something about it, but it's very necessary work. And then we can set our sail to where we want to go and map out how to get there. Our next question is, why is it taking us so long to achieve harmony? Yes, it can be a little bit frustrating not seeing much um, progress in harmony, but if we look at it from a wider point of view, evolution takes a very long time, millions and millions of years. So humanity really is just a, at a teenage state. Master Kathumi in the Mahatma letters said if you took a million years, uh, not much change will have happened. And if you look at the time we spend on this planet, it would be something maybe like 77,000 years. The rest of the time spent in other spheres. So we have a much smaller time to actually do things here. And we tend to, as humans, want to see results in our lifetime. We might live 70 or 80 years or, or longer, but we want to see change, but it's pretty slow really. Um, and evolution is slow. Think of the mineral kingdom and the animal kingdom, etc. You know, billions of years to get through these things. And it brings us to the interesting concept of free will. I think humanity's about the only uh, creature who has free will because below that the animal kingdom, etc. They just work on in instinct and nature. And the kingdoms higher than us well, they have what we call free will, but really they have to act in accordance with nature because they've let their small self go and they're now part of the one. So there's not that much free will in that aspect. And it's ourselves that have free will. And this is what takes us down the wrong path so many times. And this is where karma is so instructive. We don't want to face ourselves, and we repeat the same lessons over and over. It reminds me of the book, The Wheel of Rebirth by H.K. Challoner. And in that, there was a couple of characters who just didn't learn their lessons. And they just kept bumping into each other, life after life. It's a very good book if you would like to read it. Religions do point the way, uh, but again, we don't listen. We let pride and conceit get in the way. Uh, community harmony. Well, that's really only individual harmony. That's our own behaviour that... Uh, we conduct our own life in a good and bad situations that make a difference. And it's those bad situations which really test us. Most of the true test of our character and our spiritual progress. And are we bringing harmony into our life and other lives? Not when things are going well. So it's very um, a slow process to break the mould of individuals. And Master Serapis said in a letter to Kutnalo, a brother mind, he who cares for the opinion of the multitude will never soar above the crowd. So things will eventually, as we all spiritualize our life, come faster and faster for humanity. But this will be um, a, a future lives, I, I believe, and it won't be in our uh, lifetime, but exponentially it will get faster and faster. And this will be probably thousands of years into the future, but it will happen. Another question here is, what can one person do if a whole country or society is in conflict or in a state of disharmony? 
Yes, we do have a tendency to sit back and say, what can I do? What can one person do on their own? But that would be a mistake because we are all interconnected. And look at what some individual people have done. Look at the Nobel Peace Prize winners. They did something. They stood up against uh, oppression and injustice. These things take courage. Look at the work of the Theosophical Order of Service. Social media is making a difference in our world. In days gone by, there might be dictatorships doing uh, bad things and no one seemed to, to care. It was ignored or denied or the media was controlled. Now someone can post a clip and there'll be worldwide outrage and that leads to pressure on governments and polish politicians to do something. It just can't be ignored. So that control of the few is <clears throat> slowly slipping away, bringing more control to the people on the street. And that's never happened before on such a wide scale as I can see. So that's quite encouraging because this is a sign of growing awareness and a change in world consciousness. It's only through the individual sense of right and pushing through these unjust barriers that things change for wider society and things become more fair. And you can see some examples of this. Look at climate change. Al Gore, a decade or so ago, with his movie Inconvenient Truth and Greta Thunberg of today, those individuals are changing things on a global scale. They're influencing people. And if we look at uh, war and justice, after the Second World War, a few individuals who were justice-minded set up the Nuremberg Trials. That had never happened before for any war. And 70 years later, the United Nations still has these special courts in place. There's an improvement in, in our world uh, consciousness. And these things don't come from anywhere. They come from individuals, specifically individuals who have a growing awareness of spirit, of unity, of purpose, of their higher self. Remember Sri Ramana said, how can you help the world until you've saved yourself? And it reminds me of St. Francis of Assisi. He used to be a soldier going to war, and something changed inside him. And then he became peace lover, and his message 700 years later still reverberates around the world. So act but we all act with our conscience, which is our Buddhic nature coming to shine through. And if we each do this with integrity and courage in the millions, mass change will happen and it will change the consciousness of humanity. And I'm seeing this already, especially in the younger generations. So remember, each droplet makes the ocean. Finally, what do you think is more important? the inner harmony or outer harmony? Yes, I think it's quite self-evident that there can be no outer harmony without inner harmony. That's why it's so important for each of us to find our centre and to remain there. This is the main goal of the work before us. We shall now have our Yoga of Light meditation session to be facilitated by Christine Lim. Christine is a member of the Singapore Lodge Theosophical Society. She first started her practice with Vipassana and today is also an avid student of Qigong and sound. With the privilege of working with two beautiful modalities of sound, the gong and the alchemy singing bowls. Christine believes in bringing the spirit of self-inquiry and exploration to any practice. Today. She will be facilitating a guided meditation where we will bring awareness to the physical body before raising our consciousness through a yoga of mind. A very good day to everyone and warmest greetings this holiday season. My name is Kristen and I am from Singapore Lodge and it is my privilege to be with all of you today. I will be guiding you through a 20 minute meditation. And before we begin, please feel free to grab any props or cushions that will allow you to be seated comfortably. So let us begin by finding a comfortable seat. 
whether you're seated on the floor or seated on a chair. And I invite you to begin by closing our eyes. starting to draw your awareness inwards. Into the body and the breath. Notice if there is any tension you might be holding in the body. any clenching of the muscles. Just allowing any tension to flow away down into the surface beneath you with every breath. Perhaps you can start by swaying slightly forwards and back. Until you find a position where your spine is upright, the shoulders are above the hips, and the head is directly above the shoulders finding a point that feels the lightest, the most easeful. Tucking the chin down slightly so that the back of the neck lengthens. And start to notice the quality of the breath today. Breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Allowing the belly to hang heavy. Relaxing the belly, relaxing the abdomen. and start to notice the sensation of the air passing through your nostrils. Perhaps feeling the warmth or the coolness of the air as you inhale and as you exhale. Perhaps noticing the breath within the body, the rise and fall of the chest, the rise and fall of the belly, and just allowing yourself to settle on a sensation that feels the most predominant to you. As you breathe in, know that you are breathing in. And as you breathe out, know that you are breathing out. And 
And if the mind wanders, as it may, gently draw your awareness back to the breath. And now we start to scan the body from head to toe. With every exhale, relaxing a different part of the body. Beginning with the crown of the head. Coming down to the forehead and the back of the head. to the eyebrows and the space between the eyebrows, relaxing the temple, the eyes, the cheeks, ears, nose, jaw, and even the top. Relaxing the back of the neck, the shoulders, the upper arms, elbows, forearms, wrists, hands, and fingers. Relaxing the chest and the upper back, middle back, and the abdomen, lower back, and the lower abdomen, relaxing the hips and the glutes, the thighs and the knees, relaxing the calves, the shins, the ankles, the feet, all the way into the toes. Drawing your attention to the breath once again. And we stay here for a few moments, simply observing the breath. As you breathe in, know that you are breathing in. And as you breathe out, know that you are breathing out.
Now let us gradually begin to raise our consciousness into the higher bodies. Beginning by lifting your awareness to the emotions. Seeing the physical body disappear and blend into the surroundings around you. As you tune into a higher vibration, slowly start to become aware of the glowing sphere of your emotions. See and feel this oval sphere that is your aura, allowing the waves to settle as you find your center of stillness. As you radiate peace through your emotional body, we affirm and realize, I am not the physical body. I am the spiritual self. I am not the emotions. I am the spiritual self. Now lift your consciousness to the larger mental sphere that envelopes both the astral and the physical bodies. See your mental sphere clothed in radiant light. See your thoughts come alive and morph and shift according to the whims of your mind. You can see, hear, feel, and know them with a fullness impossible in the lower worlds. I am not the mind, I am the 
the spiritual self. From your center of stillness, sweep out all forms and let silence pervade your being. The mind is now still and alert, reflecting steadily the light of the spiritual self, symbolized by the star overhead. With an effort of the will, enter and become that star. Now bring the lumen center of awareness into the mind, irradiating it with light. Into the emotions filled with love and peace. into the physical body full of health and vitality. Drawing your awareness back into the physical body slowly start to become aware of sounds around you and sensations in the body. Whenever you're ready, you may gently open the eyes. May all beings know peace.
Thank you all for being with us in this session of lecture followed by meditation. We'll be back in 10 minutes with the next session, a lecture by Simon O'Rourke and followed by a couple of videos. You can have your tea or coffee and stay tuned for more interesting, inspiring sessions that are coming up your way. Thank you once again. We'll see you in 10 minutes.
Our next presentation will be a lecture by Simon O'Rourke. Simon began reading Theosophical books in 1992 and joined the Society soon afterwards in 1993. He has been treasurer, president, and lodge manager of Blavatsky Lodge in Sydney, Australia. He was recently appointed as education coordinator of the Theosophical Society in Australia. We shall now have Simon in this presentation which asks whether it's possible to have love and unity in time of individualism. Hello. In The Secret Doctrine, H.P. Blavatsky taught that there are three simultaneous developments within the human being, the spiritual, mental, and physical, involving the perfection of the seven principles, and that the slowest of all to develop is the mental evolution. She informs us that in order for mind to develop, the spiritual life, which would make mental reasoning unnecessary, was gradually veiled in the slow process of evolution. We are now in an upward arc of the fourth of seven rounds, covering the life of this planet in the fifth of seven subcycles, gradually learning about our psychological nature, Kama Manus, or desire mind. And in the process, we are learning to think individually. But can a mind living in the now maintain both a sense of individuality and a sense of love, compassion, kindness, and unity? It is impossible to pass by the mind, which is the link between the spiritual and the material. In the secret doctrine, of course, Fohat is the mysterious link between mind and matter. This was symbolized in the mythological story of Odysseus or Ulysses in Latin, whose Greek name means one who is hated and implies trouble, an individuality who lives with constant suffering and separation and the loss of harmony and happiness as he seeks his way home after the great war in Troy. Odysseus had fought as a warrior on the outward journey in Troy the material nature which had beguiled and imprisoned the mind, symbolized by Helen of Argos, who became Helen of Troy until freed and brought back to her senses. One may think of Prevriti here, yet Odysseus is also famous for his cunning and thoughtfulness and is a favorite of the goddess Athena. Following the fall of Troy after 10 long years, Odysseus sets off with the spoils of conquest on his return home with the same spiting, sorry, with the same fighting spirit that had served him so well in former battles. We may see this part as an inward journey and spiritual return, and one may think of Nivriti here. However, the journey home has seen many costly battles, people, friends and crew, ships and treasures diminished and lost. He must now learn to subdue his warring spirit and fight instead with the spirit of love. At a certain point in this journey, midway home, he meets with Cirque, whose spells and illusions had turned the crew of his ship into animals. Hermes, the god, advises Odysseus how to defeat Cirque, and he overcomes her spells protected by the aid of a divine herb. The allegory teaches that we too can allow our powers to be squandered by the animal nature until restored by wisdom. His sensual animal nature conquered, Cirque is compelled to tell him how to find his way home. There are two paths from which he may continue. The first is the clashing rocks in the narrow channel through which Jason and his ship, the Argo, had traveled with the assistance of the goddess Hera. The second is the narrow channel between the monsters Scylla and Charybdis. In the first channel, with the clashing rocks, the ship symbolizes the consciousness of one trying to pass through in meditation to a higher state. The clashing rocks are symbolically 
our own many uncontrolled thoughts, which rend that unconscious, sorry, which rend that consciousness to pieces and which is impossible, sorry, impossible to pass through until one is ready to be drawn by devotion to the beloved within. The goddess Hera, who inspired love in Zeus, she also representing the element of air, according to Plato's Cratylus, the cosmic elements between fire and water associated with mind. In the second path, one may travel with the guidance of the higher knowledge of the subtle forces of nature. Odysseus, on the advice of Cirque, chooses the second passing between Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla is a form of multi-headed serpent and Charybdis a monster chained to the seabed whose unquenchable thirst causes whirlpools as she draws in the dark waters to satisfy her thirst three times a day, sucking unwary ships down to the bottom of the sea and to their doom. He is advised by Cirque not to fight directly against Scylla or Desire, which she represents, as she is too powerful and she would waste his energy in a battle he could never hope to win. He passes by in his ship, remembering her words, learning the lesson that one should not fight for the sake of pride or habit. Keeping his attention forward, resisting the impulse to pit his mortal frame against eternal matter, the ship slides through the channel, but still six lives are lost to the Hydra's six heads, full of sharp rows of teeth. Perhaps one may say six past incarnations, therefore the cost is high. In the narrow strait, he cannot help passing too close to Charybdis, which represents thirst or Trishna, the thirst for material life. Her insatiable thirst draws her draws towards her an irresistible and forceful whirlpool whose downward course destroys his ship, drowning his remaining crew. When all is nearly lost, he reaches at the last moment above his head, allegorically above and beyond the mind, and clings tenaciously to a small fig tree which hangs down from the surrounding cliffs. This fig, is symbolically related to other sacred fig trees, such as the Bodhi tree. And its presence in this allegory symbolizes the last hope of wisdom between a mortal life and destruction. After further trials, Odysseus later succeeds in returning home to his beloved wife, Penelope. Together, after 20 years of longing and devotion, they unite in their wedding chambers in which one leg of their bed is a living olive tree, another sacred tree related to the fig. Their union represents the union of Atma Buddhi. We may remember that each one of us is Odysseus, leading lives of trouble and suffering, trying to find our way home. And in the part just related, through one of two paths, either through higher and inexpressible longing to pass through the clashing thoughts or through knowledge of our own nature and the forces of the lower and higher psyche. In theosophical terms, understanding the mortal nature of Kama Manas, desire mind, and the immortal nature of Buddhi Manas, being wisdom mind. We may see the two paths or approaches again in the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path, given in the discourse on setting the wheel of Dhamma in motion. One may progress gradually through developing to a high degree each noble step in turn, one by one, right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, and right kind of work, right energy, right mindfulness or memory, and right meditation. Or alternatively, one may focus the attention on the last of these, 
right meditation, devoted to the abstract, fixing the mind on the highest. With the mind dedicated to right meditation, it has been said one may gradually master all of the other noble qualifications. Right understanding and so on. In the little book at the feet of the master, the last step, which is usually translated as liberation from the cycle of births and deaths, is said to be more accurately translated as love, meaning, as it says, that pure love, which allows one to acquire all of the other qualities in order to help uplift humanity. In ancient times, the four chief virtues were fortitude or strength, temperance, prudence, and justice. Justice is the all-encompassing virtue, and according to Polis, following the teaching of Pythagoras, was the mother and nurse of the other virtues. Justice concerns all of our relationships, whether it is harmony in the country in which we live, harmony in the family, and harmony within ourselves. Therefore, the virtue of justice cannot exist without the other virtues. Or to put it another way, by developing the virtue of justice, one cannot help but to develop the other virtues or character strengths of fortitude, temperance, and prudence. Some people think of temperance as the abstention of alcohol and drugs, but it means more than this. It is self-control and has much in common with right energy or exertion. Likewise, prudence is more than a cunning and cautious mind. It is well-considered thought and memory, and the constant practice of prudence is really the same as the practice of mindfulness. Meditation is a form of interrelationship, rediscovering the whole behind the veil of the fragment. Justice is also a form of interrelationship, seeing all of the fragments as the whole, unity. Therefore, we could also say when, sorry, therefore we could also say one cannot have justice without love, nor love without justice. I know there may be appearances to the contrary, but it is worth thinking about. Mindfulness is not quite the same as right mindfulness. Similarly, living in the now, the present, is not quite the same as, strange to say, right living in the now. As we learn in theosophical teachings, every thought is built on the combination and recombination of elements from past images, including sound, etc. And each new form is permeated with the character of our motives and intentions, good, bad, or selfless. But how does the now relate to the eternal now? The eternal now also concerns eternal interrelationships. In her book, A Study in Karma, Annie Besson states that this universal law of causation binds together into one all that happens within a manifestation, for it is universal interrelation, interrelation between all that exists, that is karma. She goes on to say, it is therefore coexistent, simultaneous with the coming into existence of any special universe. Therefore, karma is eternal as the universal self. The interrelation of everything always is. It never begins, it never ceases to be. The unreal has no being, the real never ceases to be. Nothing exists isolated 
alone, out of relation, and karma is the interrelation of all that exists. It is manifest during the manifestation of a universe as regards that universe. It becomes latent in its dissolution. She goes on to say, in the all, everything is always, all that has been, all that now is manifest, all that will be, all that can be, all possibilities, as well as all actualities, are ever in being in the all. That which is outwards, the forthgoing, existence, the unfolded, is the manifested universe. That which is, as really, although inwards, the infolded, is the unmanifested universe. But the within, the unmanifested, is as real as the without, the manifested. The interrelation between beings, in or out of manifestation, is the eternal karma. As being never ceases, so karma never ceases, but always is. When part of that, which is, sim which is simultaneous in the all, becomes manifested as a universe, the eternal interrelation becomes successive and is seen as cause and effect. In the one being, the all, everything is linked to everything else everything is related to everything else and in the phenomenal the manifested universe these links and relations are drawn out into successive happenings causally connected in the order of their succession in time that is in appearance she further says the interrelations which exist in the thought of the eternal become the interrelations between phenomena in the manifested universe. The portion of the thought put forth as a universe. Before the manifestation of any special universe, there will be in the eternal the thought of the universe which is to be and its interrelations that which exists simultaneously out of time and space in the eternal now gradually appears in time and space as successive phenomena. Understanding and working out our many and complex interrelationships is an important part of life. Hence one reason that development of the mind is slower than the development of the spiritual and physical nature. Although we speak of justice as balancing these interrelationships, it may equally be thought of as love. It is from love that we may learn to bring unity in the outer life, and it is from love that karmic justice brings harmony to the inner life. Justice or harmony in interrelationships is the same as perfected love in interrelationships in which mutual concern creates the same balance and harmony justice love and even the associations of thought in the mind are very closely connected when the human immortal soul or psyche achieves individuality from the animal kingdom, the causal vehicle representing one soul to one incarnation is established. The firstborn, as has been said, it has been mentioned that animals may become individualized as human beings, either through the development of the intellect, even if that arises through the avoidance of cruelty, or the power of devotion and love to their human companions. Again, there appears in that the same idea of dual paths, a lower reflection of the mystical or path of devotion and the path of occult knowledge. 
However, the individual soul or being has yet to fully develop the individual mind. In life, we move along three broad stages, like the child who follows its parents, learning about itself and others, later growing into an adult, ready to have a family or devote itself to other responsibilities, and the last stage in which that person then retires from the world, perhaps giving dedicated attention to the spiritual life and consolidating a lifetime of experiences. Looking at the law of correspondences, we follow the same pattern through many incarnations. And again, as collective humanity, in the first stage, we learn with guidance, we observe and imitate. Then in the next stage, we participate. And in the last, we synthesize the sum of experiences, either for ourselves or others. Although they are sequential, following the law of causation, karma, yet these three stages remind us of the three simultaneous evolutions mentioned by HPV earlier, the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. When we participate and take responsibility, carry out our own dharma or mission, then there is a sense of individuality. If we fulfill that dharma cooperatively and to the best of our abilities, then there is a sense of unity by upholding the whole. That is a difficult thing to do, to fulfill our individual potential. Yet, to realize that the part is an illusion when seen against the whole. And difficult to practice is full and conscious cooperation, bringing to bear our whole nature. A child may cooperate because it does not have the power of the fruits of its growth. And that is not the cooperation of, de of a developed human being. And it can be difficult to cultivate that tolerance, which comes from patience, love and kindness, true strength, true fortitude, a philosophical tolerance in which we know the success and failure of our own duties and responsibilities and the success and failures of others will lead to greater opportunities for growth in this and future lives. For every failure in which we miss the mark, there is an opportunity for someone else to help. How do we cooperate consciously? In a small book published after her death called The Original Program of the Theosophical Society, HPB writes that she and Alcott were only given a brief set of instructions by the inner founders, the masters of the wisdom, as to what the Theosophical Society should and should not be. They were occasionally given support and advice, but were mostly left free and unimpeded to throw themselves into the work. This kind of higher trust is rare, and it is not easy to be fully cooperative where there are karmic limitations and restrictions holding us down. Perhaps the karmic lesson in this case is to realize that we may have held others back in a past life, or even ourselves, even with the best of intentions. And it may be better simply to endure until those limitations pass and we earn the right to be trusted by one who has progressed beyond the human kingdom, such as a master of the wisdom, who can genuinely see with a more complete perspective. The ultimate purpose of our human individuality is beautifully expressed in the light on the path as we seek out the way, as we try and find our way home. 
each man is to himself absolutely the way, the truth, and the life, it says. But he is only so when he grasps his whole individuality firmly, and by the force of his awakened spiritual will, recognizes this individuality as not himself, but that thing which he has with pain created for his own use, and by means of which he purposes, as his growth slowly develops his intelligence, to reach to the life beyond individuality. When he knows that for this his wonderful, complex, separated life exists, then indeed, and then only, he is upon the way. This individuality is described in this passage as not himself, but that thing which he has with pain created for his own use. This points to the idea that pain, the very thing we run and hide from and resent perhaps for years, which brings consolidation to our individuality, deserves our acceptance and attention rather than our fear. By fear, I mean that controlling fear which can make us less than noble. He continues in Light on the Path and says, seek it by seeking, sorry, seek it by plunging into the mysterious and glorious depths of your own inmost being. Seek it by testing all experience, by utilizing the senses, that is not yield to the seduction of the senses, but use them in order to explore, by utilizing the senses in order to understand the growth and meaning of individuality and the beauty and obscurity of those other divine fragments which are struggling side by side with you and form the race to which you belong. Seek it by study of the laws of being, the laws of nature, the laws of the supernatural, and seek it by making the profound obeisance of the soul to the dim star that burns within. Steady as you watch and worship, its light will grow stronger. Then you may know you have found the beginning of the way, and when you have found the end, its light will suddenly become the infinite light. It was said the founding of the Theosophical Society marked an impulse that stimulated the democratization of the occult, opening a bridge from east to west and a greater awareness of evolution. The next impulse in the last quarter of the last century was meant to stimulate widespread esotericism, a new age, and an awareness of the concept of spiritual and not just material evolution. We live in a time where individuality is being awakened in the wider community, and technology has progressed with it, moving in the last few thousand years from parchment to, to the printing press, and recently to electronic networks, communications, and the internet. In conventional society, we are not always happy with the results. Sometimes we wish people would express their feelings and thoughts and ideas, and at other times where there is hatred and divisiveness, we wish they didn't. Centuries ago, people would argue through the printed pages of pamphlets and posted journals, such as those distributed throughout Europe. Thomas More once commented, soon after the invention of the printing press, that the constant accusations of heresy in these pamphlets was not unlike a group of naked people in a field of stones. Everyone has abundant weapons, but no one has any defense. In some ways, very little has changed. New technologies have recently opened up many opportunities that were once available only to wealthy individuals and organizations. There have been 
for much of the Theosophical Society's history, independent publications. But these were usually costly to, pr to print and distribute. Recent technologies have made this process relatively inexpensive. This has brought new ways of promulgating theosophy to people throughout the world. Anyone can now publish a digital book, an online magazine, make a video for streaming, stream live radio and podcasts. We can watch presentations in video meetings and collaborate in groups. Yet this is not really new. Even from the earliest days of the Theosophical Society, people would acquire skills in their work life in the outer world as accountants, managers, printers, teachers, artists and writers and so on, and put these skills to good use in supporting their local lodge activities and committees. In the same way, the abilities and skills people have attained in their use of these newer digital publishing and streaming media technologies may enhance the present work of the Theosophical Society, being very useful in presenting theosophical concepts to the world, especially brotherhood in its full spiritual meaning involving love and unity. The Theosophical Society's first object is to form a nucleus of the Universal Brotherhood of Humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste or colour. This nucleus is itself a centre, perhaps one among many. It represents the collective members as an individuality. Just as we need a strong individuality to face the trials of the spiritual path, as with Odysseus, on his journey mentioned earlier, so too do we need a strong nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity to do the work of this society. The same idea which applies to a human being may equally apply to a spiritual organization, which, as Light on the Path gave it above, if I may paraphrase for this instance, the force of our collective awakened spiritual will recognizes this individuality as not our collective selves, but that thing which we have with pain created for our own use, and by means of which we purpose, as our growth slowly develops our collective intelligence, to reach to the life beyond the organization's individuality. Do we need theosophical societies when we have a theosophical movement and sophisticated technologies that help us to meet across the world as we once did across the neighborhood? If people work outside this nucleus, to some extent, they may work too long alone and perhaps without the benefit and support of others that are otherwise within that nucleus. For that nucleus is our most precious possession, one hardly and by long continued effort by both our fellow members since its founding and by those kindred lives we work with now. The work that we do is less important than the way we do that work and those with whom we work. The strength of our relationships have been developed over many lifetimes, developing affinity and consideration, and they will be there to help us in future lifetimes to come, and we them. If I may quote from the Jubilee Convention, those who so desire may seek alone, may tread alone their pathway, though we know that there will come a time when they will have had enough of loneliness. The strength of all movements 
that support abstract and practical brotherhood depends on the strength of the theosophical movement. And the strength of the theosophical movement depends on the strength of the theosophical society. But it is equally important to ask, as I have often asked myself, are we welcoming to people their talents and interests within the TS? Do we make the same room for others that we would like for ourselves? Giving everyone a place to grow and develop. The interrelationships in the eternal now and the present now, as mentioned earlier, are only different in their manifestation through sequential causality. There seems to be a complementary interrelationship when we try to realize our unity with humanity without, and in meditation to realize our unity with the one life within. It seems impossible to work with one without touching the other. The more we love everything in life and see that every interrelationship is in a constant movement to be resolved, the more we feel that sense of unity and the more we feel we would put our individuality in its service. We raise humanity a little towards the spiritual when we endeavor to raise ourselves and we raise ourselves a little when we endeavor to raise humanity through the Theosophical Society. Though difficult in practice, a nucleus of universal brotherhood without distinctions is an object worth achieving to help us all to reach beyond individuality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for that profound presentation on love and unity in the time of individuality. Now, we have a few questions for you. The first question is whether individuality is the same as the ego. So the question is, is individuality the same as the ego? I always think of uh, something that CWL wrote in a, quite a few of his works where he spoke about the idea of forgetting the self. And this seems to be such an important idea that uh, we focus so much of our lives on building up our own individuality in this particular life so focused on being the center everywhere we walk and with every relationship with which we engage i found it quite refreshing that simple little phrase forget the self but then it kind of opens up the door to well if we forget the self what do we think of or focus on instead and of course that is our dharma our mission in life is to understand what to focus on instead of the self or rather to use the self to be like the dancer who at first learns the steps gradually understands the choreography learns the movements is completely focused on forming uh, the movements the patterns and so on until eventually they stop thinking about the dance and just focus on relating in the performance. And there's a similar thing in ritual as well, where a person learns off some words to engage in some ritual until they reach a point where they're no longer thinking of learning or memorizing the words, they're actually expressing the words, they're expressing the dance. And in the same way, if we can concentrate and focus on our Dharma, our mission in life, the work that we're meant to do, then we can forget the self. And of course, there are these interrelationships, these karmic links formed over many lifetimes. And these karmic links, these relationships, 
help us to actually focus on what is important, which are our relationships. When we die, we don't take our work with us. What we take with us is how well we did the work and all of the interrelationships that we've had during our life. So therefore, if our Dharma and our karma, the relationships that we've come to explore and work out, are all interconnected with an organization like the Theosophical Society, or perhaps even some other organizations, workplaces and so on, then that is where we have to find the solution to the problem of life, which is, of course, ourselves. So in this, we tend to focus on what uh, is often referred to in uh, or used to be referred to in psychology as the ego, the sense of I-ness. And of course, we know the idea of egoism implies in a, in a negative context that there is something negative about that I-ness, that it is fundamentally a selfish, uh, self-focused condition. And my understanding, since these words can mean many different things, but my understanding is that this sense of ahamkara, this sense of I-ness is a little bit different to the individuality. Annie Besant once said that, and I can't recall exactly where, but once said that, that individuality has a correlation to consciousness, that that which is indivisible can't be broken up. So where there is consciousness that can't be broken up, there is the individual. HPB similarly said that although there is the one life, the one, she said there are two ones. There's the one in manifestation and the one out of manifestation. And even that one in manifestation is, in a sense, an individuality, though it is not, the, it is not necessarily uh, separate to that which lies behind it or within it um, or beyond it in some way. So individuality is consciousness and that consciousness can manifest through the sense of I-ness, the sense of ego. In a sense, the, uh, the older psychology would refer to our human ego as being what in theosophical terms we would refer to as kama manas, desire mind. But in theosophy, we often refer to the higher ego, the higher sense of I-ness, which is focused through the upper part of the mind, the higher mind or the mind of Atma, Buddha, uh, sorry, Buddhi Manus, wisdom mind. So in a sense, the difference between theosophy and uh, what is popularly known as ego for most people is really the nature of whether it is our immortal ego, our immortal Buddhi Manus, or our personal ego, our personal Kama Manus, K-A-M-A, -A, desire, desire mind. So this is only one small part of the individuality. If we think of the self, uh, the higher self, if you like, Atma, that part of our universal nature that unites with nirvana which is beyond the personal which is beyond um, the limitations that lie below it so if we look at those particular things then we can see that there is a correspondence between the higher uh, unity which hpb referred to the higher one which is the unmanifest and the lower one the manifest one with the idea of Atma and the manifestation of the self through all of its vehicles of consciousness, all representing, if you like, individuality, which belongs to that higher self, that part of our nature that is united with Nirvana. Now, this it's interesting to look at this individuality in a life because we do see that although we are individual, it does go through in line with theosophical teachings, seven fundamental changes during life. We can see that this 
individuality, which we sometimes focus so much only in ourselves, um, instead of using it for the, the true self within, for the purpose of uh, altruism, for the purpose of helping the whole and upholding the whole. Uh, this self uh, works through, this individuality works through seven stages. And we can think of it in the early part of life as a young baby that we're largely unconscious of the individual self. We simply react to circumstances around us. And very slowly and very gradually, we start to become aware of the other and start to focus our senses on awareness of the other. And this becomes the next stage, which is consciousness of the others, but is not necessarily fully determining as an individuality. And of course, the third stage is where having or growing up, we do start to become self-determining as an individuality and much more self-conscious rather than necessarily conscious of just the other or being dictated to by the other. Then, of course, we reach the midpoint where we perhaps equivalent to the midlife crisis and, and so on, where we start to question our individuality and the purpose of our individuality. We question the goals that we set as a self-determining individual. And then we start to actually go beyond that and either we stay on the path that we're on or perhaps we start to find a new path. And uh, it's, it was interesting that there were people such as Annie Besant and Colonel Alcott in the early days who actually also went through a similar, similar process in their early 40s, around 42, where they started to actually come into contact with uh, theosophical ideas and their direction changed, their individuality changed. And so this brings us to the next stage where we start to achieve different kinds of goals or perhaps goals on the same path, but we're now no longer setting the goals, we're actually starting to realize and achieve them for ourselves. And then as we start to get older, we start to again, a little bit reflecting the earlier stage, we focus less on ourselves and more on the other. And it's not unusual for people late in life to join nonprofit organizations, to start doing charity work and so on, because they're focused more on the other, looking after grandchildren. All of these things are part of the process where they start to step back a little bit from their own individuality and yet still utilizing that for the benefits and help of others. And of course, we reach the, uh, the last stage uh, similar to the seven stages of man as spoken by, uh, written by William Shakespeare, but the last stage of um, sans, sans hair, sans teeth, sans everything. And we start to withdraw from the sense of the individual and become focused on what lies beyond, where we're no longer able even to work on committees, perhaps even to give talks and lectures to help in uh, the Theosophical Order of Service or charity work, and we're largely in a withdrawal process, moving away from the physical individuality. So we see that we go through these different stages, and as a life or a, an ego, an inus that comes into incarnation, we also go through similar stages, and as a person grows and develops, they start to focus on the other to such a strong ex extent that that becomes part of their dharma, their mission in life after life. And it's important to understand what our own mission is and to just try and fulfill those conditions, even though it is not particularly easy. It can be extremely difficult. It can be so hard working with other people. It can be so hard trying to share the things that have inspired us. Uh, all of these things create difficulties and we can't escape them any more than we can escape ourselves. We can only endure and persevere and work through those particular limitations. Now, it's in the nature of forget the self and think of Dharma, it reminds me of the saying from the Bhagavad Gita, which is better one's own duty 
or dharma, if you like, responsibility, better one's own responsibilities, though destitute of merit, than the duties or responsibilities of another well discharged. And I think that is an important point. We have to understand what we're meant to do in life and persevere and endure. And through that, we'll actually gain the experiences that will help us in a later life. And so it all it tends to have a purpose. And uh, in the nature of, of morals and ethics, the virtues and so on, all of this is not meant to be used purely for itself. The purpose of developing virtues is not necessarily just to show how strong and well developed we are, the character formations, but it's so that we can truly understand the real nature of what is right and what is wrong, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing and so on. Uh, the nature of energy and abstinence and all of these things that are sometimes spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita. So in a sense, we could say, coming back to the question that individuality is consciousness and the ego is only one small part of that consciousness and that if we can understand the nature of the individuality we can understand the nature of the ego and if we understand the nature of the ego we can begin to understand the psychological uh, the wisdom aspects of our nature thank you for that clarifying answer on individuality and the ego now the next question is why is the individuality created with pain so the question is why is the individuality created with pain well if we understand based on what we we're just speaking about that individuality is uh, very much related to the idea of consciousness that it is an indivisible unbroken consciousness then we have to look at the nature of manifestation of the one life itself as we pass down through the uh, as the self if you like or that part of our nature that is united with nirvana if that part of our nature the pilgrim gradually comes into incarnation into denser and more material matters we learn in the theosophical teachings then we begin to understand that the nature of the individual and the expansion of consciousness is that it has to pass through these denser formations become one with all that is material in order to first understand it and then in order to be able to control it and especially to control oneself so this means that even from the beginning in coming to as that spiritual dimension within ourselves comes into materiality through the three elemental kingdoms through the mineral kingdom the uh, plant the animal and into the human kingdom each step of that growth means struggle against material conditions and we can see that each step of that growth enables the building up of the form side of life the vehicles if you like i always thought it was interesting that annie besant once made the comment that through pain and suffering or out of pain and suffering comes order and I thought, well, that was an interesting thing for someone to say. And when you think about it, it is order in the sense of providing the vehicle for consciousness and providing the vehicle for the expression of the individual. And this is why uh, pain, in a way, uh, why individuality is created with pain, because this is the part of individuality that is consciousness that works through the vehicles of that consciousness. And as it works, especially in the human kingdom, through that vehicle of consciousness, then that order brings strength to the individual so that that inner consciousness can better express itself. So instead of simply having dreams of helping other people, we can actually start to put that into practice 
and actually achieve the helping of other people. And of course, we're all part of the one life. And that means also learning how to accept help and guidance and support from others as well. Um, it's no good if we simply want to give and help, if we want to feel that that somehow makes us special or important. Every time we give and help, we also have to be willing to receive help. And that might be in a subtle way, such as a teaching that we read in a book where we're getting help from the author. Um, so we're still getting help, even though we may not necessarily think of it quite that way uh, while we're studying. Uh, so out of pain and suffering comes order through love, through empathy and through sympathy and so on. Of course, these are part of our spiritual nature derived from consciousness and this certainly is a wonderful thing it brings joy it brings happiness all the things that that uh make us feel more expansive that makes us more feel more in touch with unity and the one life pain tends to make us more conscious of our individual selves and tends to diminish the idea of expansiveness and uh so this is why that also leads to pain and suffering but out of that it does create the strengths for those vehicles of consciousness to better express the inner spiritual nature so from this point of view then talking about what we spoke about earlier which is to forget the self um, even though i'm talking a lot about the individuality strangely enough it's really important to forget the self and simply focus on the work that we have to do, our responsibilities, our dharma, and to learn to discriminate about whether, as that said in at the feet of the master and other works, simply to focus on what is our work and what is the work of others. Um, and that also means sometimes benefiting from the work of others. If we buy food from the supermarket, we're actually benefiting from the work and help of the farmers that put, put food into those supermarkets. So there's an interrelation going on there as well. All of this is so important to help us to grow. So love will help to draw out that spiritual part of our nature in the work that we do, but it's the pain and suffering that not only makes us strong, but also gives us the power, the ability to provide service. So in this sense, uh, pain leads to order, which leads to love, because out of pain, we also learn empathy and sympathy. Um, we know what it's like for others to suffer in a similar way. And out of that, which that leads also to service as well. So pain and suffering, is part of the nature of the of the individuality and yet we don't have to necessarily become just focused on that individuality even when we're suffering we can still focus on the whole on unity and sometimes that's extremely difficult i mean if we're in the middle of emotional pain mental pain physical pain it's hard to take our mind away from our individual selves. But if we can focus on our Dharma, focus on what we're meant to be doing as much as possible, this helps to bring our minds back to the universal. Now, our final question here is, which spiritual powers can help to overcome challenges of the inner life? uh so the question is which spiritual powers can help to overcome challenges of the inner life well i think if you look at any of the great spiritual traditions the great philosophies and philosophers we often come up with the same fundamental ideas and we can talk about it as say the noble eightfold path of developing those qualities relating to right understanding, right thought, right speech, and so on. We can look at it as the, as the chief virtues, the idea of fortitude, strength, so to speak, um, temperance, prudence, justice. These, for example, are the, 
the real inner strengths that we need to develop to then open up other and greater opportunities and other and greater powers as well. But certainly there is no greater power than to be able to and express a virtue in the right way at the right time. And if we look at the theosophical teachings, particularly related to the idea of this, the correspondences with the number seven, how that relates to so many aspects of life, then whether we look at the, the teaching related to the seven rays or the correspondences to the human being, the constitution of the human being, we can see that, that these same four virtues mentioned earlier are also expressed as a sevenfold division as well. And we can see that strength, whether it's patience, for example, the strength of adhering to duty is very important. The strength of patience, the strength of having an individuality that's firm enough to be focused on the universal and not to be drawn in different directions by the life around us. And the courage, to, in order to have the courage of one's convictions as well. I do remember that, um, that Annie Besant in one of her writings uh, relating to her Indian work, related to the idea that she was instructed to be firm, but not provocative. And yet at the same time, there are um, theosophists who have been or seen to be, perceived to be, I should say, provocative as well. So Annie Besant, whether she wanted to or not, was sometimes seen as being provocative. Uh, Krishnamurti was often seen as being provocative in his teachings uh, because not everybody necessarily understands them in the way that he expressed them. Uh, H.P. Blavatsky was sometimes seen as being provocative, especially by people in different religious traditions and the scientific community and so on. So it's important to have one's will develop so that even though there may be accusations of relating to being provocative, that we still maintain the important principles that we would wish to adhere to, to be strong, to be courageous and to be enduring. These are so important. And of course, so strength is really important. And of course, wisdom, in order to have the stillness to focus on the intuition, the inner teaching, the inner guidance within our own nature, the universal um, anchor, if you like, within ourselves, that universal light, to be able to focus on our own spirituality, our, our own principles, and to have that as a guiding light in everything we do through all of our experiences. Of course, meditation is a fairly obvious uh, experience related to that. But that stillness, the quality of stillness that we can cultivate to actually allow that reflection of inner wisdom, that is a spiritual power. And then, of course, the next one that we could develop would be to be able to actually uh, say the right thing to help a person to give them exactly what they need. And this is not an easy thing to do. In a sense, we could say that this is the basis for psychology, learning how to understand the inner nature of others and how to say the right thing to be able to help them in their understanding and their journey. And no matter how hard we try, the more we try to understand others, the more we try to tune into their needs, of course, we're going to make many, many mistakes. And yet it's inevitable. It's impossible to understand others without making mistakes. We can't necessarily go from complete ignorance of the condition of others to complete understanding unless we actually explore all the different possibilities. And at the same time, tune into ourselves as well as the other person. Uh, then, of course, the other, the next, so that ability to be able to understand others, to me, is a spiritual power. 
Then the next one, of course, would be something like, uh, well, probably like a salesperson in a way. If we try to understand the other person, it's also important to be able to provide for their needs and to know how to provide, when to provide, or if to provide at all. It's a little bit like a salesman where the customer comes in and in a perfect situation, the customer would not have any wants or desires, but only needs. And in a perfect situation, the salesperson would know how to give them the exact thing that they need to solve their particular problem for the right value, the right price, so to speak. And in other words, to be just, to be fair. And that's not an easy thing to do. Often there are people who uh, will go buy something and they're simply fulfilling their desires. There is somebody who will respond to that desire and give them something that they have simply for their own desires to make money without necessarily telling the other person, well, there's something better down the street or there's something that's both better and cheaper down the street. So, it also means learning how to tune in to others as well, not just simply uh, of saying what is right, but saying, saying it at the right time and providing to their needs. And this, of course, comes back to what I was saying earlier. The idea is not to be provocative, but sometimes we can't help it. There's the saying from Jesus where he told his disciples, uh, you know, go out into the world and teach but remember, they will hate you, but at least know they hated me first. And there's a little bit of truth to that, especially if you're discussing philosophy with the people around you. Now, the next thing we have to understand is how to gain the skills necessary for service and to know what skills to acquire, how to attain those skills. This is a, certainly a spiritual power in a way if we go to work in the Theosophical Society, it doesn't really matter what skills we have. Obviously, our interest, our skills will help us to find work there in one form or another. And as long as we have an interest in something like Theosophy, and the same thing applies to any nonprofit organization, as long as our interest is there, then we'll find the skills necessary where they're lacking or deficient. Um, but it will only work if we focus ourselves, forget the self, focus on our dharma, learn the skills necessary and throw ourselves into the work and do it to the best of our ability. Every fine detail. It's sometimes said that great filmmakers, for example, are great filmmakers because of their attention to detail, having the smallest little bit of color to have the position of props in the scenes in such a way that it expresses some symbolism related to the picture itself, to the film. And in a way, we have to apply ourselves to the work and to gaining the right skills in the same way. Pay attention to the details. The next thing, of course, is being completely uh, focused and um, completely dedicated to the work because that creates an inner fire and that inner fire then uh, can't help but react on the people around us just as much as we react on the inspiration of those around us as well. And of course, the last thing is to work with a sense of brotherhood. I know that word is probably a little bit lacking in the English language. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have anything yet that means quite the same thing that reflects the idea that we all are united as part of if you like the spiritual parentage of the one life and we are the children of that one life and that to me is part of the nature of the idea of brotherhood gender neutral um, spiritually gender inclusive if you like materially but certainly something that involves the whole and in that sense i think that kind of brotherhood where we are all interlinked interrelated is so important to develop because it's impossible to do work without that link 
And just like in a family, people will have their differences, their arguments, but the links will still bring them back together because they feel that there's a responsibility through the tie of blood, but there's a greater responsibility through the tie of the spiritual. And we can either work with that to the best of our ability, no matter how often we fail, or we can walk away from it. And sometimes as hard as that is, it doesn't always help. Sometimes we just have to endure and persevere. Thank you. The next portion of our program will be a video presentation by the Singapore Lodge Theosophical Society on their work in promoting theosophy in China. The video will be introduced by Wei Wei Du. Immediately after, we shall also have video tours of some of the Theosophical Headquarters. Hello, I'm Wei Wei. On behalf of the entire China project team, it's an honor and a pleasure to share with you what we've done in the past years. I'd like to start with a brief introduction of my understanding of the Chinese spiritual history and the current landscape. Since about the sixth century, China started to have a spiritual fusion of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. This combination seems to be very natural because on one hand, there is the universal truth as foundation in all these traditions. On the other hand, because of the utilitarian approach of the Chinese to religions and philosophies. Confucianism is mainly used for maintaining social and family orders. Chinese laws, moral codes, and social manners were based on it. Buddhism is mainly used to cultivate and purify the mind, to deal with the impermanence of life. Taoism is mainly used to improve health and restore balance in various fields in a holistic way. They each serve their purpose and support each other. So traditionally, the spiritual practice is rooted in daily life and combined with one's family and social responsibilities, which can be summarized as xiu shen qi jia zhi guo ping tian xia, which means through self-cultivation, one can harmonize the family, govern the country with righteousness, and bring peace to the world. However, this wonderful tradition gradually became a dogma and a tool for the ones in power. In the early 20th century, China became a republic. With it came the first wave of cultural movements, where the old philosophical systems were considered backwards and superstitious. They were considered the culprits for China's backwardness and inferiority. Democracy and science were considered the only way to improve society. The school system went through a thorough change. Confucian education was abolished, replaced by a secular and science-driven curriculum. In the 1960s and 70s, during the Cultural Revolution, even private practice of religion was banned. Many historical sites were destroyed or damaged. All traditions from the past were considered hindering China's progress. Starting from the 1980s, China went through a series of economical and political reforms, which allowed it to lift more than 300 million people out of poverty within 20 years, a miracle in human history. The controversial one-child policy created a new generation that enjoyed all resources of the entire family, rigorously trained in the most materialistic but logical manner. They are highly developed intellectually, at the same time, very open-minded, unconditioned by any set of religious beliefs. So China entered a new spiritual era with much energy and confusion. The majority of the Chinese population are trained as atheists, but on one hand, the old traditional values are so embedded in the Chinese psyche, in the culture, in the language, and in daily routine. They never really disappeared, and they are revived. 
On the other hand, many new influences came to China. It is not uncommon to see a Buddhist temple and a Christian church stand side by side in a village. Maria and Guanyin worshipped by the same people. This is an image of the temple for the revolutionary materials. Besides the big world religious traditions, elements and branches of New Age are also present, although the information is fragmented and scarce. Internet is almost the only source of information. Very few people know about theosophy. If they have heard about it, it's mostly from other New Age traditions. But theosophy is not new to China. In the 1920s, Dr. Wu Tingfang and some expats established a few theosophical branches in China, mostly in port cities like Shanghai. Unfortunately, they disappeared after World War II. Personally, I think now is the best time to reintroduce theosophy in China. There is an overall thirst for truth, an amid material richness and the dissatisfaction that comes along with it. The Chinese people has a spiritual base that is in line with the theosophical teachings. And most importantly, the mind is ready. The mission of the Theosophical Society is to spread the ageless wisdom in the world. It becomes obvious that China is the last blank spot, and the 1.8 billion Chinese-speaking population worldwide should benefit from the Theosophical knowledge as well. This seems to be a daunting task, but some enthusiastic members in the Singapore Lodge threw themselves into the work. On December 3rd, 2011, under the leadership of Sunny Chung, president of the Singapore Lodge, the inaugural meeting of the China project was held and the Chinese project team was formed. The first task was of course, to reach out to the Chinese population via internet. On August 16, 2012, the Chinese Theosophy website developed by Sister Tabikong was launched. It was ported to the current better version in 2018. Translation work is a major part of the project. Besides a few Chinese books found in the Art Yard Library, there's no theosophical literature in Chinese. In January 2011, Brother Hao Chiu Hong started helping Victor Hao Ching Jr. with the translation of Ageless Wisdom. Later, more books such as An Outline of Theosophy, The Mystery of Life, Key to Theosophy were translated. Translation is an endless task. The first 10 years of efforts start to take some effect. By September 2021, we have 16 people joined as associate members. They are mostly educated young people in their 20s and 30s. This also means that we need to develop a Chinese study program for this group. Videos of lectures proved to be the best way to provide compacted theosophical education, especially when the Chinese diaspora is all around the world. And within China, people are spread over a vast territory under COVID constraints. The team already subtitled Pablo Sanders' Foundations of Theosophy. The Singapore Lodge has an English series of lectures called A Course in Theosophy, which was compiled by Sunny over the years. It was proven to be a very effective way to recruit new members. We finished the video production of these seven lectures in Chinese this year. The power of social media cannot be underestimated. When our members in Hong Kong created a TS chat group, initially with the associate members, since the first video was released, it was spread through other people's blogs and other social media. Almost overnight, over 80 people joined the platform, interested in knowing more about theosophy. Moving forward, our plan is to make more videos on various theosophical topics. The Singapore Lodge has a very well-developed English program, and we plan to use it, which can save us a lot of time. Also, there is a plan to translate a textbook of theosophy and more books. 
They will be used as study materials for associate members. Our biggest challenge is manpower. We are a very small team and we do whatever we can. Translation needs time, a good mastery of both languages, and good knowledge of theosophy. We also need good Chinese lecturers who can explain what's written in the book in an engaging way. But in Chinese, there is a saying, xin xin zhi huo ke yi liao yuan, a spark can light up the whole horizon. We believe in the power of truth and the will of people. Thank you.
at this time, we shall now have the various Theosophical Order of Service video reports coming from India, Pakistan, New Zealand, and the Philippines. Again, thank you for joining us. Namaste everyone. Welcome to Theosophical Order of Service in India. We are having 22 regions actively working on service activities with about 100 groups. We have about 7,000 members enrolled in assisting these activities. Please see our activities. Thank you.
name is Renee Sell. I'm from the TOS in New Zealand. I bring greetings from both myself and also our team in New Zealand, Carol Collier, Sue Harrison and Vicky Jerome. We're just going to do a little update today. Um, New Zealand sponsors 54 children in India and Pakistan. We also sponsor two uh, candle schools in Pakistan as well as a yearly contribution to the Golden Link College in the Philippines. This year we really branched out into extra projects in New Zealand. We had Sue Harrison who initiated in the Hawke's Bay a project at her local school for breakfast, uh, a breakfast and lunch program as well as buying some swimming togs and pyjamas for June for the kids less fortunate. TOS New Zealand has a TOS group in the Waikato. It's led by Carol Collier and this group do several projects including music afternoons every month, guest speakers and also supporting the local teen parent unit at the local high school as well as the women's refuge in the in the Waikato as well. It really is lovely to share the projects that we've done here with everyone throughout the world and I'd like to give a special thank you to Nancy Seacrest and to Tim Boyd for their endless support of the TOS. The New Zealand National Section have been a long-term support of TOS and very much know the value of service in theosophical work, so they have helped support in many ways. TOS New Zealand has a special announcement to make this year. I have coordinated the TOS in New Zealand for the past 18 years and I've been very blessed in this work. I've been part of many projects to help those less fortunate than ourselves. I would like to thank everyone worldwide that has been part of my journey, all the wonderful friends and people that I've come to know. The TOS journey has been the journey of my life and I'm so very grateful for that. But it is time to bring someone else into the role who's working in the community and it is an honour to announce that Carol Collier from the Waikato will head the TOS in New Zealand. I wish Carol heartfelt love, support and many blessings going into the future. I won't be too far away, I'll be there supporting her in the background and I'd also like to wish everyone throughout the world a peaceful holiday season and every blessing for 2022. So thank you to everyone.
Thank you Thank all you. for being Welcome. with us. Hope you enjoyed the sessions. Stay tuned. We'll be back in about 50 minutes, five zero minutes at 9 a.m. GMT, starting with short talks. Thank you. Hola, Sara. Hello, Sara. Hola, solo quería ver tu voz. Está bien, perfecto. Sí, perfecto. Gracias. Chao. ¿Aló, Alfonso? ¿Me escuchas? ¿Alfonso? Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días. Hola. hola Alfonso. Sí, hola, hola. Estamos haciendo el test del audio para el canal de España, español. Oh, ya te escucho, Alfonso. Perfecto. Vale, muchas gracias. Buenos días. Gracias, Alfonso. Vale, chao. Vale, vale, Alfonso, perfecto. Chao. Hello, Ruth. How are you? Can you? Okay. I just want to know if your voice is coming. It's coming perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, perfectly. I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. You can, you want, you can stay muted. And when the program begins, you can unmute yourself and make the translation. Thank you, thank you, Shun. Hello. 
Gujarati sister. Sister Ranjan, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello, Sister Ranjan. Are you there? Okay, your voice is coming good. Thank you, you can mute yourself. Bonjour, Pierre. Pierre, can you hear me? Wait, wait, or, or Pierre, can you hear me? Oui, oui, oui. Très bien. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Merci. Uh, Wait, wait, can you hear me? Oh, we oui, oui. It's muted. Yeah, we are asking her to unmute. Let's see, because, or maybe she is right now, not here. Okay, I'll try. Oh, salut, wait, oui, wait. Oui. Wait, wait, can you hear me? Mm, wait, wait, I don't know if you are talking. I mean, I cannot hear you. I can hear my voice coming from, okay. Wait, wait. Yeah, uh, your voice is coming okay. If you want, you can just stay muted and just unmute yourself when the, we are going to mute you, Pierre, and then you can unmute yourself once you begin the translation. Wait, wait, can you hear me? You have the number? No, she does, I guess. Wait, wait.
Euh, bonjour les Français. Nous avons trois personnes euh, là et je n'arrive pas à comprendre qui est qui. Donc la personne qui ne devrait pas lire la traduction maintenant, veuillez vous partir et rejoindre le webinaire avec le lien général, s'il vous plaît. Ah, désolé, c'est toi. Euh, tu es le... Euh, Christa, c'est oui, oui, oui. Tu m'entends Oui, je t'entends. Enfin, je vais te okay. contacter par WhatsApp. Je n'ai pas de WhatsApp. Christa, je n'ai pas de WhatsApp. Oui, je vois. Je... Maintenant, je comprends qui est qui. Merci, c'est bon. Tout faut. Juste un petit seconde, je vais te renommer. Ok. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, wait, wait, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. You want that? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello, Russian translator. Yes, uh, what's your name? Oh, hi, Natalie. How are you? My name is Catalina. I just wanted to check your audio. It's coming very good. Okay, so you can mute yourself and unmute uh, once the, the session begins. Thank you. 
Natalia, right? Okay, thank you Natalia. Bye. Hello, this is Manuela, second German speaker. Okay, thank you, Manuela. I will assign you to German also. Hello, Manuela. How are you? Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, your voice is coming good, so everything is okay for the translation. Thank you. Thank you. If it is a different uh, se session, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. Bye. Bye.
May I extend my fraternal greetings to the Convention from Scotland. Welcome back everyone to this session from Europe and Africa. Our speakers each address ways in which we may gain freedom from our Maya propelled transient world by attaining the pinnacle of human consciousness. I'm delighted to introduce the three speakers of this session. Our first speaker is Tran T. Kim Ju. Kim Ju has been a member of the Theosophical Society in France since 1972. She is a postgraduate in pharmaceutical technology. Kim Ju is chairperson of the European Federation of the TS and vice president of the TS in France. Her main concern is to encourage cooperation and to promulgate the teachings as well as to share experience in service of the TS. Kim Ju promotes a new way of living where each human life can be guided by universal ethics in the mystic dimension of consciousness. The title of her talk is Moving with the Timeless. Greetings to all. I wish to all participants an inspiring convention. Humans as we are, we are all prisoners of time. The hectic daily occupations, whether they are actual in our life or they only concern others, play an accelerator's role in the movement of our thoughts. One easily lets oneself drawn in this world of agitations so that at times one can lose one's footing and lose direction of one's life. The feeling of being imprisoned can be sensed according to the moment, meaning according to the daily process of our activities. This prison, though not formed of iron bars or of magnetic holes or of laser fences, holds tight those who are jailed. In the development of events, one may ask, what is a human? What is time? How is it that humans have been trapped in this invisible prison and eventually how to get out of the circle of incarceration. According to the theosophical teaching, a human being with its complex components, which are not to be developed and analyzed here, so a human is consciousness. All the visible aspects of a human being express this consciousness. In the particular way, consciousness expresses itself by emotions, feelings and thoughts. Generally, the mind manifests itself through thoughts. And most of the time, the mind is full of thoughts, images, ideas, and each of these may be still or in movement. The movement of thought produces the notion of time. This does not mean that when the mind is captured in an immobile picture, there is no time, because it is undeniable that whether thoughts are in movement or are frozen as a snapshot, time is always there. All the components of a human being from the level of pure consciousness densified themselves down to the level of the physical body transiting through what the second generation of writers, theosophical writers call bodies or vehicles. Levels differ by densification from high to low and vice versa, from low to high through refinement. The human complex lives and keeps a dynamic profile 
in the constant transfer between levels conducted by the densification or refinement of the constitutive substances. Although one can read so many times the quotation from the QT cited in the Mahatma letters, I quote, matter is the crystallization of spirit and spirit is the sublimation of matter. Although one can read it many times, one does not realize that this statement applies to the whole universe, including humans, and does not only serve as a theoretical, metaphysical speculation for occasional students. A human being, as consciousness, acts like a microcosm of the dynamics of the universe. In other words, a human being forms a dynamic unit of the universe acting in concert with the universe. Consciousness is always moving, so much so that, as said a humorist, you cannot tell your age at any moment since it is changing in the meantime. The movement implies the whole universe, but at the level of the gross matter, like the physical body, the emotions, the feelings, the movement escapes observation. Even more at the level of thought, yet by attentive observation, all thoughts reveal its whole movement, and the movement of thought induces the senses of time. Consequently, not seeing the movement of this thought implies one unknowingly stays in the domain of thought, imprisoned in its movement. It goes over and over until the, the, the ultimate breakthrough. It is as simple as to get out of a prison, the prisoners must see the prison. Otherwise, unconsciously, they might gladly continue to improve the conditions of their jail. They can feel satisfied with the situation of being prisoners. One may understand that necessity, one can understand the necessity of cyclical crisis. This sounds a bit cynical, yet none can deny that consciousness in the lower part of its embodiments need to be shaken to wake up and come near to the, the reality. One may take this in a lighter way in comparing these crises with baby teething, a natural way to grow up. But let us get back to the matter of time, our great prison. Readings and studies can give some knowledge about time. Time categories itself into two types, chronological and psychological. Chronological, ti chronological time on the earth level derives from conventional agreement. It is different from on March or on Jupiter. On the cosmic level, time is bound to space and thus becomes a theoretical speculation all dependent upon space. On both levels, time depends upon surrounding factors. Indeed, travelers get the impression of being still when, they, when their vehicle moves at the same velocity as the one of the decor. Be it a moving wall or another transportation vehicle. Time being produced by movement abolishes itself when experiences find themselves in the continuum moving at the same velocity as the surrounding. Psychological time is entirely subjective. One hour 
on the watch for one person may last twice for another. This observation, repeated, repetitively related by experiences, has turned out to be popular myths, like the one of the sleeping hollow, hollow or the legend of the white waters. In both stories, the fallen in sleep experiencer wakes up after a longer duration of factual chronological time. In human life, daily life, one can live the experience in a quite trivial manner. Indeed, when one must do something necessary but unpleasant, one tries to do it as quickly as possible to get rid of it, but feels the task long-lasting. On the contrary, living a pleasant experience, one yearns to make it last longer, but finds it quite evanescent. In short, time on the psychological level amounts to a fleeting illusion. The illusion is the prison. If one is unaware of the events occurring inwardly, one has lost one's footing in the stream of life, and the merry-go-round will continue. From the primitive consciousness of the earlier kingdoms, humans gained the evolved level of self-consciousness, imparting the ability of seeing itself from the inside. The seeing that one is in prison testifies to the ability, this ability of seeing oneself from the inside and the endeavor of getting out of the prison gives evidence to the living evolutive dynamic of dynamics of the universe in the human consciousness. The vital factor in the endeavor lies in attentiveness. In the incessant stream of evanescence events, if consciousness keeps attentiveness, it illumines their meaning as well as their process, and thus may lead the observer to a greater realization. One comes to see that time is not continuous. The constant stream of thought leads to the common presumption that time flows uninterruptedly, but thought look like beads in an unending necklace, gathered by the threat of volition. This imposes on the entire process an appearance of continuity. Seeing the discontinuity of time is breaking through the boundary of the prison of thought, hence the prison of time. Living with the timeless is moving with the movement of consciousness which exists since the beginning of time. The great paradox here is that consciousness is consciousness in this movement does not have an identity. There is just consciousness as one single movement living, developing itself without self-identification. Whilst in any experience there are the experience as a thing to be experienced, the experiencer as the actor, and the experiencing as the action. There is no division here, no one seeing, no observer. Since here consciousness is alone, without any second entity, one can say that there cannot be any experience of the timeless. The experiencer disappeared. There cannot be any experience, any experiencing. Yet the discursive mind may dispute that manifestation 
begins with time. So how can one reconciliate moving with the timeless and manifestation beginning with time? Here the mind must be quietened and focused. Consciousness is everywhere. Calling levels of consciousness is just a way of saying there is consciousness for physical survival. Consciousness is feelings, emotions. Consciousness is mind and consciousness is intelligence and compassion known as Buddhi. Consciousness as universal intelligence known as Mahat. Consciousness as the germ of the next manifested world, the next Mavantara. When asked what stays when everything will disappear, Plato answered, goodness. As where Buddhist writings mention Alaya Viknana, which is understood to be the deepest level of consciousness that is knowable. The same Buddhist writings also mention Karuna. Karuna, compassion, as the foundation of the universe. Then what is felt intuitively seems reasonable. That is the equivalence of the three concepts, karuna, alaya viknana, and goodness. Utterly living, consciousness is always there, from grossest, the lowest, to finest, highest. Consciousness is present, just because it is one, undivided, unbound to time. The present stands for the immaterial link of past and future on the horizontal line. Sometimes one may read, read an expression such as the eternal present, but this is a linguistic abuse because being always in motion, the present cannot last but it is just a transiting point between what has irremediably occurred and what would is still to happen. The present is part of time. It, it can be unique, lasting for eons, but not eternal. The now is not part of time. It is pace as such which has no beginning, no end. Thus, now the timeless has nothing to compare with the present. It is the oneness of space which was, will be, and is forever. So moving with the timeless means living on the deepest or highest level of consciousness, meaning also with goodness and compassion without naming, because there is no longer self-identification, self-consciousness, but living according to the natural order of the universe, or Rita, from which derives later on ethics. At this state, no one is there to self-identify as somebody ethical. It is a natural motion inside the movement of consciousness, the consciousness one. This state illustrates the description in the Upanishad, which Jiddu Krishnamurti used for himself when he was asked, how one can know that one no longer lives in the prison of time? And his answer is short concise as in the Upanishad, water cannot know the taste of water. At the end of my sharing, a challenging question may pop up. Who is the witness of all this? Who is the witness of what is happening? 
The answer is consciousness itself. Or still, the silent watcher, which is just a way of saying for awareness, which is universal intelligence in action. Thank you, Kim Ju, for a thoroughly researched, most erudite and inspiring presentation. Kim Ju has given us insight into how we may avoid distraction by the phantom apparitions cast from the wall of Plato's symbolic cave, so that we may remove the shackles of our minds and tread upwards towards the metaphorical sunlight of Samadhi. Our second speaker is Erica Georgiades. Erica has been the director of the School of the Wisdom since August 2021 and director of the European School of Theosophy since 2018. A member of the TS since 1991, she has worked at the International Archives in Adja from 1994 to 1996. Erica is a candidate for a Master of Research degree in Religious Experience at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. She also holds a postgraduate degree with merit in ancient religions at the same institution, and also a Bachelor of Arts with Honours in Philosophy and Psychological Studies. Erica is also a deep ecologist, animal rights activist, and advocates pro-personhood rights to non-human animals. She lives in Athens, Greece. The title of Erica's talk is Replace the Fleeting with the Everlasting. Greetings to all attendees of the 146th International Convention of the Theosophical Society. The title of this talk is inspired by a sentence found in the Voice of the Silence that says, open quote, replace the fleeting with the everlasting, close quote. In the same work, we also find the following, open quote, in order to become the knower of all self, meaning the universal self or Atman, thou hast first of self to be the knower. To reach the knowledge of that self, thou hast to give up self to non-self, being to non-being, close quote. Atma is described in the Theosophical Glossary as pure consciousness or the cosmic self. To reach the knowledge of Atma, one needs to transcend the sense of selfhood. Many religions and philosophical traditions suggest that in order to transcend the sense of selfhood, we need to live in the now, in the present moment. The present moment is not, however, linked to space and time as we know it. It is, in fact, linked to eternity, as we will see very soon. But first, let us make a short digression into the philosophy of space and time, in which we will find out, among other ideas, the notions of presentism and eternalism. Presentism supports the notion that space has three dimensions and is temporal. Things exist in relation to time. This is the conventional view of time based on the notion that the past is gone, the future is not yet here, only the present moment is important. Within this context, uh, the past and future are meaningless because they do not exist. Based on this perspective, if we outline what exists, we have the following, you, the computer, Acropolis or the caves of Ajanta in India exist. However, Socrates and Buddha do not exist, nor any future station on the planet Mars. Objects lacking the property of being present do not exist and are meaningless. Eternalism on the other hand, supports the notion that space has many dimensions and is non-temporal. It is deprived of properties such as the past, present and future. Things exist without relation to time. 
the past and the future are meaningful and important as the present moment. Eternalism is anti meaninglessness and suggests, for example, that every act of kindness, no matter how small, exists in eternity. Everything is profoundly meaningful. Objects from both the past and the future exist. Non-present objects like Socrates, Buddha and the future station on the planet Mars exist now. Even though they are not currently present, they may not be in the same space, time, vicinity that we find ourselves in right now, but they should nevertheless be on the list of all existing things. In eternalism, the passage of time is an illusion. Reality comprises the whole of space-time. I shall make a brief disclaimer. Please notice that eternalism, as mentioned here, is not related to the Buddhist doctrine of Sasatavada in Pali or in Sanskrit Sasvata Dristi, usually translated as eternalism, a kind of thinking rejected by the Buddha in the Nikayas involving the belief in an eternal self. Instead, it is linked to the illusion, um, linked to the notion of time being an illusion, as it has been supported, for example, by many modern scientists such as Mark Taggart. And even uh, Madame Blavatsky also suggests in the secret doctrine, open quote, that time is only an illusion produced by the succession of our states of consciousness as we travel through the eternal duration, close quote. HPB is an eternalist, not a presentist. Um, the theosophical teachings are inserted within an eternalist approach, but what is eternity? Blavatsky links eternity to the notion of duration and explain that, open quote, duration is, it has neither beginning nor end, how can you call that which has neither beginning nor end time? Duration is beginningless and endless. Time is finite. Close quote. Krishnamurti was also an eternalist, as we can see here. Open quote. Is there a meditation which has no direction, which is not conscious, deliberate? Find out. That requires great energy, attention passion, not lust, that is just. Then that very passion, energy, the intensity of it is silence, not contrived silence. It is the immense silence in which time, space is not. Then there is that which is holy, eternal. Krishnamurti is describing a state we could say similar to Samadhi. It's a state of consciousness that there is no sense of separation, selfhood or independent existence, but only pure awareness described in the voice of the silence as a state of being or, a, or a, as a state of consciousness that occurs when the fleeting is replaced by the everlasting, the transitory replaced by the eternal. Having briefly shown the difference between presentism and eternalism, as well as how the notion of eternity is emphasized by both Krishnamurti and Madame Blavatsky, as linked to a state of consciousness deprived of the sense of selfhood, we will now see how the eternal and the present moment, an instant, can be reconciled. Consider, for instance, the following words of Get. He is describing a painting that he saw. The marvelous, open quote, the marvelous suppleness with which a dancer moves from one figure to another and provokes our admiration in front of such artistry. It is fixated for a moment so that we can see simultaneously the past, the present, and the future. And we are thus transported into a super terrestrial state. Uh, 
We do not have here with us the painting that Get was observing. Instead, we have the image that you see here, which is a statue symbolizing Shiva's cosmic dance. In looking at the image, even though it's fixated, we can see both past, present, and future. As the hands and legs suggest motion, we can infer the previous step and the one ahead. In this manner, the present image contains both past, present, and the future. That is how when experiencing the present, one also will experience past and future. That's how perhaps an instant is impregnated in eternity, with eternity. Plato, for example, supported the notion that time is not something that can be measured, but motion. Abstracting time from motion was um, an innovation from Aristotle. The notion that an instant is impregnated with eternity is also found in the Epicurean uh, and Stoic traditions. For example, Lucretius, a Roman and Epicurean philosopher, wrote that, open quote, the sage places himself with the eternal nature, which is independent of time, close quote. In this manner, the present moment, one instant, becomes the living symbol of the unexplorable, as we cannot explore eternity, triggering a profound feeling of union with a reality that transcends the limits of the self. Such states of consciousness are often experienced by mystics and sages and may be described as cosmic flights. The view of a sage gazing infinity, as this image suggests, who in an effortless state of tranquility contemplates the infinity of space. The importance of living in the present moment is also has been also emphasized, for example, in the Hermetic tradition. Asclepius, a disciple of Hermes Trismegistus, in his perfect discourse in Greek, Logos Telius says, open quote, Now, be completely present. Give me your whole attention with all the understanding that you are capable of with all the subtlety you can master. For the teaching about divinity requires a divine concentration of consciousness, if it is to be understood. It is just like a torrential river plunging headlong down from the heights, so violently that with its rapidity and speed, it outstrips the attention, not only of whoever is listening, but also of whoever is speaking. Asclepius is showing how one may reach the knowledge of divine wisdom, Brahma Vidya, which is by first pointing out the importance of being present, full alert, paying attention to the moment, to the instant impregnated with eternity. To do that is require divine concentration, dharana, because divine wisdom is like, he says, a torrential river, whose flowing waters move in such a speed that if we are not alert, we cannot keep up with it. He compares the experience of, actually the experience of theosophy, divine wisdom, Brahma Vidya, as being something at first as a violent torrential river. We could think of a river flowing down into a giant waterfall. The closer we get to the waterfall, the rapids become more intense and violent. Violent because it turns apart all preconceived ideas. Everything you took for granted, all crystallized thoughts are shattered, violently interrupted, blocked. Furthermore, in the Corpus Hermeticus, there is the following quote. My child, he who listens must perceive the same as he who speaks. Share his awareness. He must breathe together with him. 
share the same spirit. His hearing must be sharper than the voice of he who speaks. The seeker who is listening perceives the same as the teacher who speaks. Both are in tune and sharing a state of pure awareness. Notice the text says they breathe together, share the same spirit. The Persian word for intimate or companion is ham dam, meaning one you share a breath with or one you breathe with. Kingsley mentions that the same word is used in Sufism as meaning being of the same breath. They need to be tuned with each other in a state of shared awareness. That's why the one who speaks share his or her awareness. In the case, the one who speaks may not be only the a, a, a human teacher or a superhuman teacher, but also nature, life around us. And we have to learn how to listen. Uh, no wonder why one uh, of the last works of Madame Blavatsky was entitled The Voice of the Silence. This is very telling, the title. Now, Krishnamurti described awareness as, open quote, observation without choice, condemnation or justification, silent observation from, from, from which there arises understanding without the experiencer and the experienced. In this awareness, which is passive, there is no end in view to be gained, and there is no becoming the me and the mind, close quote. Krishnamurti is describing samadhi, pure awareness, during which the observer and the observed are one. In this state, there is no sense of separation, nor of selfhood or independent existence. Samadhi is the highest state of mental concentration that people can achieve while bound to the body and which unites them with the highest reality. Self-consciousness, union with the spiritual monad by intense and profound spiritual contemplation or meditation. The main challenge is to be able to focus on the eternal or the eternal now is letting go the sense of selfhood. And this can occur only in a profound state of tranquility and divine concentration during which the person becomes passive. In order to understand what is meant, I can only ask you to try to recall, to remember a moment of contemplation you experienced in nature or another setting during which you completely lost the sense of self, space and time. In that moment, you had a glimpse of Samadhi. Many of us have experienced it. That's also a living experience of the divine, of the sacred, when the observer and the observed become one. Most of us never learned or were taught how to achieve that state. It just happened during a moment of effortless tranquility. I suggest you to try to focus on the now. Then you stop and focus on the eternal for some time. Feel the difference between these two approaches. It is irrelevant whether one knows or not what the eternal is. What is important is that this the shift from the idea that the present is the only thing that matters as past and future are gone, to the idea that the present is impregnated with eternity. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for a most inspiring and comprehensive presentation. I particularly enjoyed your comparative approach, illustrating ways in which the eighth and final limb of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, Samadhi, has been described. 
I also love the use of the image of Shiva Nataraj as a symbol of past, present and future as he dances upon Apis Mara, the dwarf of evil and ignorance, this illustrating how an instant may perhaps be impregnated with eternity through alignment to the rhythms of the cosmos. Our third speaker is Paul Martin Lukusa Mbebwa. Born in 1960, Paul Martin has a Diploma of Industrial Accountancy from the Belgian Central Jury and a Master's Degree in Liberal Theology from the Liberal Institute of Theological Studies, France. He became a member of the Theosophical Society in 1998. Paul Martin is director of the Prakasha Study Group in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo. By profession, he is a national director of an NGO that works with the agencies of the United Nations. The title of his talk is Perseverance. Paul Martin will deliver his talk in French. You can listen to the translation into English by choosing English among language channels when you have clicked on the interpretation button. Please, Paul Martin. La perseverance. La perseverance est l'une des vertus majeures indispensables, une vertu cardinale tout au long de notre cheminement spirituel sur le sentier de la perfection. C'est un puissant levier de commande, un faisceau de lumière qui éclaire le visible pour voir l'invisible, qui clarifie le contour du plan divin pour que nous l'accomplissions en connaissance de cause et en union avec le divin. Dans cet éventaire de qualité jugée nécessaire à tout aspirant pour atteindre à sa véritable et pleine stature figure, l'expérience quotidienne nous apprend la plupart du temps à nos douloureux dépens que sans le secours de la persévérance, le succès est rarement, sinon jamais assuré dans nos entreprises individuelles ou collectives et s'étend dans nos affaires humaines aussi bien et surtout sur le chemin de la spiritualité. Conscient de sa nécessité pour notre évolution spirituelle, nous constatons qu'il n'est de succès durable qu'au prix de continuité et de patience dans l'effort. Cette condition préalable s'applique aussi sur le terrain de la spiritualité. Nous savons qu'il ne faut jamais se lasser de veiller et de frapper à la porte avant qu'elle ne s'ouvre. Nous soulignons le pouvoir d'exaltation de la persévérance qui s'est traduit à nos yeux comme la loi du progrès laquelle préside au perfectionnement de toutes choses. Dans les effets de la persévérance, toutes nos œuvres fondent leur efficacité essentiellement sur le bon exercice de la volonté d'être toujours conscient pour vaincre le combat de l'existence qui est rude et perpétuelle et surtout le combat en soi-même entre la nature humaine et divine. Du combat en soi-même, de la nature humaine et divine, nous trouvons une invitation à nous laisser creuser et libérer. Nous sommes invités 
à laisser évoluer notre nature divine afin qu'elle puisse absorber la nature humaine. C'est avec beaucoup de persévérance que nous pouvons arriver à cette victoire. Nous découvrons alors que la persévérance ne peut que nous disposer à accueillir une plénitude qui ne dépend pas de nous. Ce bonheur profond, fruit du consentement à être habité par un amour altruiste. La persévérance donne la possibilité de connaître notre mission de vie. Pourquoi sommes-nous sur la terre elle nous pousse de vivre, d'exister pleinement et de découvrir peu à peu sa raison de vivre, de savoir pourquoi on est là en ce moment précis, dans ce corps et dans cette situation particulière. Elle nous pousse également d'aller chercher plus de connaissances plus vastes, plus diffuses, particules adamantines. Elle nous donne la signification et la raison d'être liée à son origine, son parcours et sa, de et sa destination. Elle ne serait rien d'autre que la reconnaissance de son essence divine. Elle est la connaissance du chemin parcouru, deux étapes qu'il reste à franchir et la reconnaissance de sa volonté de réintégrer la lumière et sa place au sein de l'amour divin. C'est pourquoi beaucoup d'instructeurs recommandent de méthodes en matière de spiritualité, de perfectionnement, privilégiant la récitation persévérante de prière ou de formules sacrées, de nombreuses pratiques dévotionnelles ou initiatiques. En réalité, persévérer demande plus de courage que de se livrer à une action définie, surtout si on imagine qu'elle pourra immédiatement porter ses fruits. En faisant allusion, aux difficultés que nous pouvons rencontrer sur notre itinéraire, venant s'opposer à nous sur notre route, la vie quotidienne contre vent et marée, en dépit des difficultés et de la pesanteur de la vie matérielle, pendant le moment de découragement, de doute, d'affliction ou de, de, de tristesse et de malheur qui nous entoure ou qui nous frappe. Sous cet aspect, la persévérance sera la force qu'il nous faut trouver pour ne pas nous laisser abattre par ces obstacles et remporter quand même la lutte. En réfléchissant, aux raisons évidentes de tous les échecs que nous rencontrons dans notre vie, il apparaît qu'il provient davantage de nos faiblesses de caractère que de nos actions. De notre existence, nous savons que le bonheur ne s'obtient sans que nous prenions notre part de fort dans la recherche de la paix du cœur l'harmonie avec les autres, avec le cosmos, une relation confiante avec Dieu et une acceptation de soi-même. Pas de bonheur sans désir, pas de progrès spirituel sans collaboration entre notre liberté et notre volonté. Il s'agit bien de prendre notre responsabilité de choisir notre mode de vie. Il est donc question de renoncement 
et de persévérance. Si nous sommes persévérants dans ce sens, nous nous évaderons de la prison du temps pour pénétrer conscient dans le monde de Dieu, monde qui est aussi un royaume, royaume au-dedans de nous. La persévérance est l'une de sortes de vibrations que nous appelons d'une autre façon mouvement pensé ou vibration action, etc. Pour qu'un homme n'est capable d'arrêter la marche puissante de la divine évolution. L'homme est de nature divine. La force qui émane de lui renferme en elle-même le pouvoir. Ce qu'il désire, la nature le lui donne au moment voulu, quand l'heure a sonné. L'homme est maître de sa propre destinée et ce qu'il réclame de l'univers, l'univers le lui donnera. Il recueillera le fruit dans la partie de l'univers à laquelle il appartient. Raison pour laquelle notre persévérance dans la spiritualité doit être d'une aspiration plus haute afin d'être sur le plan mental supérieur de canaux ou de ponts pour descendre dans le monde manifesté. Profitons de ce que nous venons d'entendre en ce moment pour être de véritables ponts entre quelque chose de plus abstrait et la vie de tous les jours. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Paul Martin, for providing us with an excellent presentation illustrating the crucial requirements of perseverance and of aligning our personal will to divine will as a means of realizing our essential nature. Importantly, Paul Martin emphasizes the requirement of us functioning, functioning as channels on the higher mental plane, whereby we assist in the implementation of the divine plan. Thank you also to all participants for your attendance and contributions. The next item in the program is the overview of the Theosophical Order of Service activities in Europe and Africa during the past year. This will be presented by Patrizia Calvi. We'll be back with the TOS report of Europe and Africa in 15 minutes at 10 past 10 GMT by Sister Patricia Calvi. Stay tuned, have a cup of tea or coffee and be right back with us. Thank you.
Dear friends, participating in the 146th International Convention of the Theosophical Society, I'm very happy to present you the activities of the Theosophical Order of Service in Africa and Europe. The activities under report were severely affected all over the countries by the pandemic restrictions. But uh, the good news is that uh, despite the coronavirus, most of our fearless teams were able to offer their help and solace in relieving human suffering. In so honoring Annie Besant's words, the essence of leading a divine life is given. The Theosophical Order of Service, or TOS, as I will refer to it from now on, operating in many parts of the world, was founded in 1908 by Annie Besant to reduce the sum of pain in the world, to some extent at least, and at the same time to help its workers to learn and evolve through their service activity. Service, in my opinion, is the best way to put into practice the first aim of the Theosophical Society. So, friends, let's go to the overview of the intrepid service that was done in many different countries in Europe and Africa. Enjoy it! A monthly healing service organized by GOS Belgium for its members is held in Antwerp and in Brussels. Since September 2021, it is possible to participate to the meditation at the lodges before they were online. There was also an online healing meditation for peace on the 19th of October 2021 on the occasion of the International Peace Day. Normally, TOS Belgium is present at each national activity of the Belgium Theosophical Society, but due to the lockdown, there were only online national activities. Several members continue their private TOS initiatives, visiting older members, supporting children in schools, helping in a soup kitchen for the homeless, volunteering in non-governmental environmental organizations, and so on. TOS Belgium is still looking for volunteers wishing to knit bears for the project Teddies for Tragedies. TOS England donated £10,000 to TOS ADR to alleviate the effects of the COVID-19 crisis in the surrounding area of Chennai. TOS England has, to date, shipped over 27,250 teddies overseas thanks to the generosity of two charities, the International Aid Trust and the Furniture for Education Worldwide, who convey the teddies free of charge. In addition, the TOS has also collected computers, printers, projectors, gardening implements, tools, sewing machines and so on, all of which have been sent overseas by Furniture for Education Worldwide. This has continued, although limited, because of the restrictions. The late Walter Kearney, president of Wallasey Lodge, was a loyal and staunch supporter of TOS and encouraged relatives, friends and neighbours to need teddies for the TOS. As in the previous year, 
some members raised funds for the food bank and this resulted in 30 parcels of food distributed to poor families in the Philippines. Nonna Nina Maki, coordinator of TOS Finland, informed us that donations came from private individuals and that it was not possible to conduct fundraisers. On December 12, a traditional porridge party was held to celebrate Christmas with music, a small-scale play and a relaxed get together. In the face of the continuing pandemic-related impossibility of organizing its usual fundraising sales, the French TOS many members and friends have shown touching fidelity. Through their generosity, the TOS has been able to offer its full support, as usual, to the nine educational and humanitarian service projects it sponsors in India, Africa and the Philippines. French TOS members are painfully aware of the great challenges faced by workers on the ground in these countries, especially those trying to educate underprivileged school children stuck at home without ready access to the modern communication devices necessary for remote learning. A tightening of lobbying and supportive fraternal links has taken place with these dedicated servers. The members have again knitted hundreds of teddy bears this year for children in the suburbs of Paris who are victims of domestic violence or without gifts at Christmas. A number of members are involved with other environmental activists in projects to clean up the rubbish in their local communities and to stimulate awareness of global warming amongst children through storytelling. In March, an exchange was arranged by Zoom between TOS members in France and Argentina who are seeking to re-dynamize their TOS work. This contact was happy and mutually enriching. As a main line of activity, TOS Hungary continued its work with the Warm Heart Association of Tapio Bicke Village and with the Gypsy Community Council of Fulokirk's village. They managed to recruit volunteers for collecting donations of various objects and of sweets and non-perishable food, of clothes and toys, for Santa Claus and Christmas. Several truckloads of these have been distributed mostly to poor gypsy families of Fulokirks and Tapiobichke. In both villages, they donated money and supplies required to start the school year. TOS Hungary sent money donations also to those unable to purchase enough food or fuel to heat their home during the winter. Another truckload of various items and homemade cakes have been delivered to Tapiobichke to cheer up their Children's Day festivities in May. The Worm Heart Association was also helped several times to buy petrol so they could distribute the collected items among the villagers. Responding to the wish of Fulokert's gypsy community, one of the TOS supporters made three benches to be set up at the bus stop of the village, so old people and pregnant women could sit down 
while waiting for the bus. In March, TOS Hungary contacted Pustarabani village and, responding to their wish, they collected and delivered three truckloads of non-perishable food, toys and clothes. For this purpose, they set up 10 donation collecting points in Budapest. This year, the number of requests for emergency support donations for families soared. Elderly couples, families with many small children and others taking care of old relatives received a sum of money as donation to ease the crisis. To commemorate the 10th anniversary of TOS Hungary, they organize a team building event in Kizekset. Their virtual healing group is in its ninth year of operation and works according to TOS right. In these last months, the group, led by Susanna Kovacs, excellent in her role, have a rather large number of patients. Ushasha, coordinator of TOS in Kenya, informed us that 2021 was a hard year. The spread of the coronavirus resulted in lockdowns, closing of schools, educational institutions and businesses all over Kenya. The Nairobi Lodge started its new year at the end of February 2021. It was rather difficult to carry out any planned service projects like caring for the environment, animals and so on. But luckily, TOS Kenya was able to contribute with funds to three vocational training centers on the outskirts of Nairobi. They invited applicants for training in tailoring, carpentry and landscaping. Three candidates were selected, the fee is paid and the applicants started their six months of vocational training. TOS Kenya has also financially supported the lodge caretaker, Mr. Mutua Mwaganji, for his course in accounting and business studies. He has already passed the three stages and he is into the third year. TOS Portugal supports financially two organizations, Chaos dos Bichos, that takes care of hundreds of cats and dogs and prepares them for responsible adoption, and another that creates jobs for people who suffer from blindness. Besides that, they collected and donated a lot of clothes shoes and useful objects to an organization called CASA, which is like a free supermarket for homeless people, where they can go and get free clothes, blankets and so on. TOS Spain has continued with its support to the NGOs Comparte and Personas, both working in Central America and involved in providing not only book supplies and scholarships to most disadvantaged children, kids and youngsters, but also in donating food packages and medicine kits to communal health centers. Moreover, Personas NGO is promoting drilling of wells to get the much-needed water supply for agriculture and human consumption 
in local rural communities of Haiti. TOS Spain continued also to support the COVID relief in Uganda and the project Feeding the Hungry in Chennai, India. Pictures of daily food distribution in Chennai were regularly uploaded into their website. TOS Spain participated also in the project Oxygen for India, related to COVID-19 pandemics, through the Vicente Ferrer Foundation and donated tablets to the Olcott Higher Secondary School in Adiar, Chennai, so that the most disadvantaged students could attend lessons remotely. The Internal Solidarity Project was created at the beginning of 2021 in Spain to help members, sympathizers and others in economic difficulties for the impact of COVID-19 pandemics. In addition to that, some lodges and groups regularly carry on their own service activities, such as healing rituals, zodiac and peace meditations, and so on. TOS in Sweden supports an English project called Mango Tree Goa, which operates in the slum of the city of Goa in India. From 2012, this association has been building schools and kindergartens for children. The students are fetched with the bus every morning and driven to school or kindergarten where they receive not only teachings, but also clothes, supplies and meals. Just before the pandemic, instead of renting it, the organization finally succeeded in buying a house that now is under renovation. During the pandemic, they distributed food packages also to the families of the students and most pupils could follow online classes, so this resulted in very few cases of COVID among them. Tia West Tanzania and Heart Babies Project Students Team from Canada contributed with 4 million shillings, that is around 1,750 US dollars for the open heart surgery of two children at the Jakaya Kikwiti Cardiac Institute in Dar es Salaam. Many educational activities are carried out. Three students are subsidized in their university studies and Dr. Yashi Dubak and Dr. Hitesh Chohan provide the Dahaya Punja Library with newspapers, magazines, books and theosophical material. TOS Tanzania also supports more than 90 children at Chanika Orphanage. In this institute, masks and sanitizers have been distributed too. Other initiatives of TOS Tanzania are the eye checkup camps and distribution of free eye glasses and the distribution of lunches for cancer patients at the Ocean Road Cancer Institute. The family of the late brother P.S. Patel made a donation to TOS Kenya to support their activities. Last May, TOS Ukraine organized an international forum on the theme Ways of Spiritual Development for Men and Society, so to find peaceful solutions for all the problems of humanity. 
the meeting gathered spiritually oriented people and organizations and there were 20 speakers from Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, India, Philippines, Canada and more than 2,000 participants. Three groups of the Theosophical Order of Healing are working weekly, now online, and connect members from Kyiv, Dnipro, Tsitomir, Kropivnitsky, and Kharkiv. More than 100 people got help, support, and hope for their future life. This work is very useful and inspiring for both the members of the healing groups and for those who are helped. The book of Vicente Hao Ching Jr. on education, education without fear and comparison, was translated, edited and printed in Ukrainian and Russian languages. The book was presented at two international conferences at the Alternative School Mosaic in Kropivnitsky and at the City Library in Nadvidna. Other initiatives were carried out in the city of Kropivnitsky, such as donations to the House of Mercy and Regional House of Mother and Child, help to animals and ecological activities, while in Zitomir there was a box exhibition on the ageless wisdom at the city library. Finally, in Kyiv, books were collected and donated to the libraries in hospitals and military divisions. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, TOS Italy has carried out numerous projects, even if some of them had to be adjusted or put on hold because of both the nature of the activities, which could not be carried out in respect of all the new hygiene and safety regulations, and because of the difficulties they had in raising money due to the lack of in-person events. During the first wave of the pandemic, TOS Italy helped the families in need with essential supplies. More than 3,000 euros worth of food, cleaning products, supplies for personal care and hygiene, food for pets and so on, were purchased and distributed. The project, started in Vicenza and Rome, is still active. Since 2013, TOS Italy supports the Syrian people fleeing from the war, especially the ones living in the Baba Salam refugee camp in Syria. Of a vital importance is the presence there of Dr. Ali Nasser a Syrian refugee himself, active in medical care, especially for children. Years ago, two containers with the function of a pediatric clinic were installed in the camp and are still operative today. In 2020, the US Italy supported the renovation of the whole clinic, including essential structures in order to allow disabled children to assess the premises. Dr. Nasser, who manages the clinic, is fully funded by TOS Italy. In December 2020, TOS Italy sent funds not only for the relief of malnutrition, a very widespread plague in the camp, but also for the purchase of kerosene so that families could face the cold weather. For some years, TOS Italy have been engaged in supporting activities for a small group of former ethnicity, especially children, residing in the province of Vicenza. The activities are carried out collaborating with the municipality, local school and with the local Caritas Centre. 
Since last year, the community has been helped through donations of clothes, tools for cooking and eating, prams for babies and so on, but also with gifts for special occasions, such as Christmas, children's birthdays, the end of school and so on. That was extremely important, especially during the COVID-19 crisis, when TOS helped them to purchase essential goods to face both the lockdown and the coldest months of the year. Two healing groups are active in Italy, one weekly and one monthly. But TOS Italy participates also in TOS international projects such as the Alcott schools in Adia, the Candle Home Schools in Pakistan, where they subside two classes of elementary school children, and the Women Empowerment Project in the Odisha State, India, for the higher education of 25 disadvantaged girls. Finally, TOS Italy kept supporting the activities of the Little Flower Convent in Chennai through donations and funds. This institute welcomes 800 children and young people who are deaf or blind, giving them the opportunity to obtain a recognized diploma and to find a job instead of being condemned to survive in poverty excluded from the society. For theosophists who have understood, at least theoretically, that unity is the nature of existence, daily life cannot but be service. The work of giving immediate help to those in need cannot be neglected, the more in these challenging times. So, let the light of altruism shine. Let us be compassionate. Dear sisters and brothers, hope you had a feeling of inspiration seeing the work of TOS going on in Europe and Africa and relate to it in your own respective places, which is the essence of humanity. Now, before we proceed to the interview of Jenny Becker, we have a couple of videos to share with you that is of headquarters of Theosophical Society in Amsterdam and of ITC Naden. Stay tuned and enjoy. Thank you.
Hello, friends. Welcome to this interview with Jenny Baker at the International Convention of the TS in 2021, Living in the Now, Challenges of the Inner Life. The Theosophical Society, being founded in 1875, the United States was its first and England its second section founded in 1888. I have the honor now to introduce Jenny Baker, National President of the English Section of the TS. Jenny's first encounter with Theosophy was in 1981 at a yoga weekend at Tackles Park. The objects of the society seemed to resonate with yoga philosophy so perfectly that she joined there and then. She attended her first summer school in 1989 and has attended everyone since then. She became the director of the summer school in 2005. Jenny has served on various boards and committees for the TS England and the Foundation for Theosophical Studies and was elected the national president in 2015. In 2017, she gave an excellent talk about the Crest Jewel of Wisdom, Viveka Chudamani, at the EFTS Congress in Barcelona. Besides Theosophy, her interests include yoga, music, photography, and rambling in the countryside. Dear Jenny, welcome. The question to you is, what, according to you, is the challenge of the inner life and how to overcome this challenge? Thank you, Els, for that introduction. I would like to describe the challenge to the inner life with two words from the Sanskrit language. These are Maya and Avidya. Maya is usually translated to mean illusion. And Avidya literally means of, without, and vidya knowledge, without knowledge. So we think of it as ignorance. Can you explain more about Maya and Avidya? Certainly, Els. Maya is sometimes referred to as a veil that hides the truth from our eyes. This veil stops us appreciating the real and blinds us from our true self. Maya is the cause of our ignorance of the eternal life within us and for us mistaking the unreal for the real. Does H.P. Blavatsky have anything to say about Maya? She certainly does. She says in The Secret Doctrine that Maya, or illusion, is an element that enters into all finite things. For everything that exists has only a relative, not absolute, reality. She continues. As we rise in the scale of development, we perceive that during the stages through which we have passed, we mistook shadows for realities. And the upward progress of the ego is a series of progressive awakenings, each advance bringing with it the idea that now at last we have reached reality. But only when we shall have reached absolute consciousness and blended our own with it, shall we be free from the delusion produced by Maya. The universe, she adds, is called, with everything in it, Maya. Because all is temporary there in, from the ephemeral life of a firefly to that of the sun. Maya can only be dissolved by the knowledge of absolute truth. 
and can be perceived only by humility and true inquiry. The concept that this world is only an illusion and therefore not real is hard to understand. Can you explain more about it? I think that the first thing we have to grasp and accept is the fact that we are not a body that has a soul, but instead we are a reincarnating spirit that inhabits a physical body for the length of its lifetime. We can then ask what happens to the spirit when the body dies. We know that it continues in another format. Those who do not believe in an afterlife and think that death is the end of everything are wrapped in the veil of illusion. Theosophy teaches that anything that changes and that has a beginning and an end is finite and only relative reality when looked at with physical eyes absolute reality is beyond our understanding. So, you see the challenge of the inner life as the conquering of illusion and ignorance. How can this be achieved? HPB says the first necessity for obtaining self-knowledge is to become profoundly conscious of our ignorance to feel with every fibre of the heart that one is ceaselessly self-deceived. The secret doctrine says that however much we study sacred texts and listen to sages or gurus, we cannot grasp with our finite mind something that is indescribable, incomprehensible and infinite. Once we realise that everyone has a spark of the divine within, a minute part of the absolute consciousness, we lose all fear of death. We begin to move away from materialism and go towards spirituality. Have you any suggestion as to how to do this? Yes, here are a few suggestions. Firstly, we must seek refuge in the intuitional part of our nature by practicing meditation and by looking deep within ourselves to the higher self for guidance. Secondly, we must never lose sight of the divine light within us. Thirdly, we must be disciplined in our spiritual practices and aspire to serenity and silence. For it is only then that we will know our true self, that which never dies. Fourthly, never to despair, but to persevere however hard it may be to lift the veil of illusion. I am reminded of the Vedic prayer which could be used as a meditation. It goes like this. Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light, from death to immortality. These words, when said sincerely from the heart and not just from the mind, take us, with practice, to a higher level of consciousness. To finish, here is another quote from HPB. Progress is made step by step and each step gained by heroic effort Conquered passion can no longer turn and rend you. Be hopeful then, not despairing. With each morning's awakening, try to live through the day in harmony with the higher self. Try is the battle cry taught by the teachers to each pupil. Naught else is expected of you. One who does his best is all that can be asked. To sum up, Illusion is the cause of our ignorance of reality, but by using our inner strength, by perseverance and by stilling the mind and looking towards the infinite, we can achieve our goal of oneness with the Absolute.
Thank you very much for these deep reflections, dear Jenny. Friends, we will close this interview with a short film made by our brother Damon Scothern as a warm invitation for the upcoming Congress of the European Federation hosted by the English section. The theme will be healing oneself, healing the world. It will take place in York. Join us for the 39th European Congress of the Theosophical Society at York. Be there.
Dear friends, near and far, we continue the 146 International Convention with the following session. After Elle's interesting interview with Jenny Baker, I have the honor now to introduce to you the three panelists who will be speaking in this session one by one. Marie Harkness, Manuela Kaulich, and John Ellert Benedictson. Marie Harkness is a retired teacher. She has always felt drawn to the ancient wisdom and mysticism. She joined the Theosophical Society in 1983. She served as Regional Secretary, Northern Ireland, from 1987 to 1994 and also from 2003. She has served as organizing secretary of the TS in Ireland, Northern and Southern Lodges combined since June 2005. She served on the executive committee of the European Federation from 2007 until 2010. Presently, she is a member of the International Council of the ITC in Naarden. Manuela Kaulich, she is living in Regensburg, southern Germany, together with her husband, and they have two children, and she is working as an architect. Since 32 years, she has been a member of the TS, serving in the board since 2005 as General Secretary since 13 years. She has founded a group in Regensburg where members are studying twice a month and a full day every autumn. The service of a disciple is fascinating her very much as well as thought forms. The Voice of the Silence is her favorite book. John Ellert Benedictson was born in Reykjavik, Iceland in 1951 and has been General Secretary of the Icelandic section of the TS since 2018. From 2001 to 2008, he served as Treasurer and in 2006 he became editor of Gangleri, the journal of the Icelandic section of the TS. He has been president of the Blavatsky Lodge in the Icelandic section since 2007. Now, friends, as I am sure everyone is impatient to hear your answers to the different questions, let us go directly to the subject. We have received several questions addressed to the panelists. Let me start with the first question that is where do inner challenges? come from? Marie, would you like to start? Yeah. Inner challenges can be partly karmic, a settling of accounts for former actions. These can also be a blessing in disguise, as they provide opportunities for swifter inner growth from the lords of karma, what, uh, once one is dedicated to a life of service. Without these crises and our successful handling of them, we would not grow stronger inwardly or spiritually. Even should we fail in a challenge, our efforts are never lost. We will do better next time by coping calmly in a detached manner with each as it arises. We in time can act intuitively from the center within us we also can attune to the source of light, which is the best defense, provides the best protection and helps us cope with any outer or inner crisis. Doubt can be replaced with certainty. Through such regular practice, our efficiency is greatly improved and we see more clearly. Higher help when we have earned it is given from within us. Worry and fear are not possible when giving each challenge due consideration and one pointed attention with a measure of thought control. This is the way of inner growth. Master M referred to the former international president, Annie Besson, as a diamond soul. A diamond is polished with friction before it shows its true beauty 
and light. Thank you, Marie. Yeah. John, would you like to contribute to this? Oh, this was very good. This okay. was very good. I think uh, if we, we are limited to one hour, we, there is no not much room for further. Il semble que nous avons un petit problème technique à Adyar. Uh, it seems that we have a small technical problem in Adyar. We will take back the session as soon as possible. or inner crisis, doubt can be replaced with certainty. Through such regular practice, our efficiency is greatly improved and we see more clearly. Higher help, when we have earned it, is given from within us. Worry and fear are not possible when giving each challenge due consideration and one-pointed attention with a measure of thought control. This is the way of inner growth. Master M referred to the former international president, Annie Besson, as a diamond soul. A diamond is polished with friction before it shows its true beauty and light. Thank you, Marie. Yeah. John, would you like to contribute to this? Oh, this was very good. This okay. was very good. I think, uh, if we, we are limited to one hour, Let's room for Let's see how, how it goes. Thank you, Manuela. I I have something to contribute a little little more. Uh, quotation from Charles Letbitter: To hear the voice of the silence is to understand that from within comes the only true guidance. I uh, thought about that. Um, where do many possibilities, possible changes, challenges come from? And I found that uh, normal people, people who don't know about theosophy, yes, they have challenges too. Uh, and their challenges come from conscience. They are conditioned by religion, families, etc. So do they have challenges too, was my question. And I'm quite sure. Have. Most of us are pondering about situations in the past, what is right, what is wrong. Could I have done something better or not? And how? Some same for the future. So most of us are looking for our own mistakes and those of others, and therefore we are satisfied. I think these are inner challenges too. 
more or less. And uh, I think it is important to take an eye on that because uh, we are role models as theosophists and this is how it starts or it begins. Thank you, Manuela. Okay, question number two. Knowing the importance that is given to an altruistic lifestyle, what is the correlation between the altruistic lifestyle and the living in the now? In other words, what do ethics have to do with living in the now? John, I'm going to ask yes, yes. you want to see it. There are some points I noted. Uh, ethics arises quite naturally from living in the now. Living in the now means that there are no divisions in time and space. It means ultimately unity and wholeness. And whoever is living in the now finds himself one with life in its very form. Heartlessness, for instance, would be the spontaneous outcome of living in the now, as well as giving up other forms of one living in the now will automatically seek to assist other beings for a further expression of their true nature. For one converted such, that living in the now means a life of service. To a degree, it works both ways. So, worthy and aware and expression of compassion and sympathy are true nature can loosen the whole of selfish personalities as on us and help us to forget ourselves and our separate interests and ambitions and become more sensitive to life as a whole. A life that is seeking expression through various forms. Thank you. So that was my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Marie, would you like to add something to this? Yes. Uh, to live in the present, in the now, with a certain measure of success, we must train ourselves to grab the moment and give it our full one-pointed attention. It is essential to have a good measure of thought control, to bat off distracting thoughts which will disappear in time and practice. We have inner principles within us, an innate sense of right and wrong, more finely tuned as we make inner progress. It is recommended to live a clean life but have a mind which is open to help and inspiration, treating each moment as a gift. In our short time here in this plan, we learn to receive and thereby project and radiate light. This can beneficially affect all others near and far. Each day well lived makes a lovely memory and the promise of an altruistic and better tomorrow. Thereby, it is essential that we concentrate our energy and focus on the present moment. Thank you very much, Marie. Manuela, would you like to add something to this? Yes, thank you. Um, my idea was the role as, uh, uh, no, uh, model of philosophist. So a lot of people nowadays are looking for truth, but there is a lack of generally understanding terms, connections, explanations by people who know, like theosophists do, who have already realized the serenity of the problem. So we have to clarify um, a lot of things. The concept of theosophy must be made known to a wider audience. Topics of the ancient wisdoms must be discussed. Explanations of spiritual connections have to be supplied so that people can develop an overall view. So that these important topics become generally understandable. And last but not least, to help in conquering fear and enabling people to take responsibility. I uh, quote <laughs> a sentence that Tim Boyd uh, used two years ago. Uh, Albert Schweitzer said, 
example is not the main thing in influencing others. It is the only thing. So as philosophers, we should be aware of our function as role models. Empathy, a helpful attitude, sympathy and selflessness are required. And Charles Peter said, our work is to help the whole forward, to push any part of the wheel. Life at all levels is the divine life. And if we are helping forward any part of that, we are helping the divine plan. So whatever uh, we, which kind of service we use, we are very, very useful for this divine plan. Thank you. Now our third question. What, in your view, is the most important challenge of the inner life of a human being today? Mary, would you like to start? There is much materialism and stress in today's world. And yet, in spite of this, there is always the promise of a higher humanity and life ahead. Remember, we are not on our own. There are higher agencies hard at work rooting for us continuously radiating their light and wisdom on those ready to receive. In the past, men and seers left their outcomes, isolated themselves in caves and forests where they meditated and prayed for all. In today's world, just into a new millennium, we are required to be in the world, but not all, mixing with and working with all others. It takes a tremendous effort to get the balance right, to be friendly and efficient in the workplace, yet it is essential that our whole outlook on our vision and method in dealing with all others is stamped by the goal of higher service. We make progress with the inner life one point of dedication to the path is through daily reading, study, and meditation. There is more joy and less angst traveling the middle way, getting neither related when we feel well or down when we are facing challenges. Manuela, would you like to add something here? Yes, I would like to start on the basis like before. Uh, I would say first, I must search for myself, find myself, my true self, my inner voice, and ultimately the voice of the silence. It's no more basic than at that point. Through it, I will find the harmony, peace, and tranquility that we need so urgently. Then I'm in oneness, connected with all that is. And at at the same time, I'm in my own strength. On my way to unity, I can then look more and more for the good of all. You remember the role model as a theosophist. And uh, a second very important thing for me is uh, joy of life. Joy of life opens our senses for impressions directed to the path. One approaches and deals with people differently if one goes through life with joy. From joy of life, true love develops, which again gives strength for daily life and strong faith. Thank you, Manuela. Very beautiful. Uh, Jan, I'm going to ask you if you would like to add something, some thoughts of that. No, I, I, the... Both of them were excellent. Okay. Thank you. Now, question four. How can we transcend the flow of sensations and emotions? Why is the purification of the vehicles so important to achieve the living in the now? John, would you like to start? Yes. Please. The flow of sensations and emotions is transcended undivided continuous attention. We must become fully aware of our emotions in our daily life and try to see what they really are. 
wat we weten, zie je al de reacties rijden met wij. Ook is cover al de reacties solidair, more or less due to habitual reactions. This is a hard thing to do because we often are only dimly or partly aware of what is going on in our psyche. I don't recognize the true nature of our emotions. The limit is the limit of consciousness that you experience to allow separate sensations and not as an unsighted whole of reactions. In pure consciousness, unobscured by thoughts and emotions, all is one, and there is no separation. However, the act of knowing know for one, as and over is a no case. But these high moments or glimpses come seldom. And they become continuous, result in a steady flow of illumination. According, according to Patanjali and other teachers, Living in the now means a consciousness of much higher frequency than that of course lower vehicles. So the lower vehicles will have to be refined and continue to those higher vibrations until they can keep up with them. Refinement is needed, a sort of transmutation, transformation, and finally transfiguration. In spiritual discrimination or discernment, what is the source of our consciousness? From where to come? We can, for instance, assume that our spiritual aspiration is the result of higher investment. Our spiritual discipline, attending instantly to the higher matters, all levels, feeling, growth, deep, and turning away from lower and coarser matters, we are so indeed that eventually we are Thank you. Your that was my favorite. Thank you. Manuela, would you like to contribute to this question? Yes, I would like to, um, to repeat uh, or to remember Janu Polanita uh, from Finland from last year, his contribution, he uh, spoke about the two errors of the Buddha. Pain and suffering come at us from the outside. We can't escape that. It is karma mostly of the time. It is karma, oh, yeah, pain or anything. But we can help determine our reactions by pausing and observing our perceptions, emotions. By doing so, we can diffuse the second arrow that we shoot ourselves. And this is um, very important for me because it helps in daily life. Um, the attachments, our attachments slow us down. Do not allow the vibrations of our subtler bodies to get through to our higher self. They hinder our growth. growth. Uh, this is what uh, Jon already said, but uh, perhaps in other ways, our subtle bodies have small antennae that can clock quickly and then disrupt our sensations. Our bodies are surrounded by a magnetic field. This is strongly influenced by our environment, for example, already when shaking hands, corona is greeting, huh? Uh, our thought vibrations also influence our peoples, but also those of the people around us. Conversely, we are also influenced often enough negatively. After all, we can't always decide where we want to be. So our vehicles often enough load up with growth mental matter. Only few and high thoughts consist of very rapid vibrations and remain untouched by coarser particles. So we have to clean our mental bodies as often as possible so that it can vibrate high as possible. I found a sentence from Krishnamurti. He says, We cannot succeed in keeping our 
the body to fuel by fighting with their causes. We must turn to the pure, to pure thoughts, feelings, emotions, and physical experience. Thank you, Manuela. Now I'm going to Marie. Would you like to add something? Yes, I add a little. Without a certain amount of purification of our veins, physical and mental, we are unable to see clearly each situation that arises or be able to give good advice and help oneself. With increasing control of the mind, awareness, and focused attention, we will intuit, know how best in any given instance to act. To help others and thus aid in the uplifting of human consciousness. We are aware that thought manifests. Constant higher thoughts and dedicated service as you know, will no doubt hit their mark and are pleasant to all. It is our increasing inner light which attracts the attention and help of the Holy Spirit. Master Cambridge has advised as regards are living in the dark. I quote, ardent glimpses, truth and light, and learn to follow them at all costs. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Now we go to question number five, which is, which kind of contribution can give uh, Krishnamurti's teachings on the matter of living in the now? Uh, Manuela, would you like to start with that, please? Yes, I will. Uh, Krishnamurti, we know, is not interested in hypothetical questions. He deals with facts, with the real being, with what is now. He's not interested in what could be. He deals, investiga he deals in investigations with the reality of our existence, not with part of it. So he deals with the whole and therefore with the now. We should discover what we are and not what we would like to be or what we could be. Could be is uh, the most interesting for the most of the people. <laughs> could be, but we are not. He wants to teach us to understand not verbally or intellectually, but to perceive, to feel. Not to make an idea of something, to see the beauty in it, to see the whole of whatever. It is important what is, for him is important what he is. He wrote numerous letters about mindfulness, observation and learning from it, and about self-awareness. It all is living in the now for me. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, John, would you like to add something to this? No? Okay. Uh, what is there to add? Okay. Uh, this is very good, I think. Thank you. Uh, Marie? Can uh, you add Yes. Krishnamurti's advice on daily living behoves us to be aware that our fixation as regards our actions born of former knowledge and our limited understanding of thoughts as a result, causes us to live in conflict and struggle. He maintains that time is a psychological enemy of man. To truly live in the moment, he recommends pure observation insight without any shadow of the past or of time. That in so doing, this brings a deep, radical mutation in the mind. He offers that when there is negation of all relationships psychologically, then there is love, compassion, and intelligence. He explains that the uniqueness of man lies in complete freedom in the content of his consciousness, which is common to all men. Thus, one can Thus, one can seriously take in this precious advice board 
live truly and effectively. Thank you, Marie. Um, okay, we're arriving to question number six. How can we face the conditioning of our consciousness that is feelings, emotions, thoughts? Um, Manuela, would you like to start with that, please? I'm sorry, I have to repeat. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but attention and introspection are required, but also reflection and tolerance. Overcoming conditions is a long process that requires a lot of tolerance towards ourselves, constant effort. Often enough, we will not be satisfied with our reaction, but we have to start again, again and again. We also need to gain inner strength, be able to take on challenges in a focused manner. And we need great perseverance. Very bad word for me. I remember again Yanni Bonavirta's talk. He said, by these, by these two arrows of the Buddha, you can uh, become aware of your um, conditioning too. So, in this way, yes, we can recognize conditioning and slowly but change our reactions. If there are no further reinforcements, conditioning can lose its power. So, we can recognize conditioning through observation. Then we can slowly erase it over time with our knowledge that it is affecting us negatively. So, observing, observation all the time. We can also counter conditioning with positives. We can replay the situation again and again until we are content with ourselves. And relaxation exercises are also helpful before a stressful situation like today or anxiety. Meditation could be another option. In any case, would help with mindfulness. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, Marie, would you like to? With each small step we take in mastering, overcoming our emotions, thought processes with full awareness, we build up and increasingly gain more power and strength in control of peace and in seeing clearly. As we make progress with sincere intention, higher helpful thoughts also come to us to encourage and fill the void. Thus, in time, we are not conditioned by former thoughts, actions, and words. We then intuit and act more from the center. The more we work and align with the higher forces, the more light we receive and thereby radiate. We then serve at a totally different level. There is a higher way of living of thinking and evolving. And as members of the Theosophical Society, we are so fortunate to have been shown the key. As Krishnamurti has indicated, the uniqueness of man does not lie in the superficial, but in the complete freedom from the content of his consciousness. Beautiful. Thank you. John? Well, uh... I think uh, humility, courage, and make it uh, We must have the courage to face everything in our psyche, the bad as well as the good. We must discover or see how all this that we are, our personalities are, how, this come, how did this all come about? And how did it manage to mold our personalities? This is our inquiry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, Manuela? I have a quotation from Krishnamurti. If you are interested, I can. Uh, in his letter to the schools, or from the letter to the schools, Krishnamurti says, conditioning is the result of centuries of fear. 
anxiety, conflict, and the search for inner as well as outer security. So he says, and this is what I make a little bit closer. So we need to investigate our inner nature, which is very complex. This investigation is real self-education, not to change what is, but to understand what is. This is his message. Thank you, Manuela. Okay, we come to the seventh question, which is the last one. And it says, what does the understanding of the sense of impermanence, which affects all of us, imply in our daily life? And I'm going to invite Marie to start with the question, the answer. As TS members, it is essential and recommended that we develop a sense of detachment towards our possessions. And any day-to-day -day situations that may arise, which we have to deal with. It also helps to look on our loved ones, our friends, and our possessions as being on loan to us. Not ours, but on loan to us. And nothing is perfect. Love, born of compassion, understanding, and survives. That is not impermanent, that lives. All nature is cycling. Everything changes with the season. Likewise, the life of a human being is cyclic, moving from infant to child, adolescent to adult, and eventually to the elderly, old age. These are the human and animal seasons of life. Nothing is bad. Meantime, in our daily lives, from and knowing we only have certain time on this birthday. We may increase our kinship and service to the higher path and powers. This is a thread which is more permanent. As we progress, time spent giving attention to inner development is not a gift, but under their auspices, we make progress and qualify for greater service in each succeeding. Our efforts are not wasted or impermanent, but are beneficial. Our emanations, even without speech, can reach and help all we meet and work with in our daily lives. For example, a rose does not speak, but its beautiful form and scented emanations do. More importantly, to frequently have it sense of gratitude expressed for the many opportunities and blessings which have come our way in this lifetime is noticed and appreciated by the higher thank you Marie. thank you okay um john would you contribute would you like to contribute to this uh, i have very little to say to add to this but uh Understanding sense of impermanence. Well, one could say that uh, it can restrain us in success and strengthen us in adversity. Right. It can also help us to understand that our separate bodies of personality affect the reaction in the brain. outer events, thoughts and feelings. So one could say that uh, this, this creates a whole new outlook on life. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we don't try continuously to, to hold on something, run away from something. We just have to accept the situation as it is and know that this is only like in a dream. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Jon. Um, Manuela, would you like to? Uh, yeah, I would go on with Jon's um, 
thought, uh, non attachment, non attachment to material things is very important to us. It hurts when we lose it, but this is very, very simple. Uh, to know that nothing lasts forever, whether pleasant, difficult, or bad, means even the most severe illness will end one day. I think this uh, gives hope to every uh, seriously ill people. So we should not despair in difficult situations and learn practicing patience, still more patience. Stress reduction is very important. Uh, I would like to add um, at that point, and um, well, everything is changing every second. You no, know. uh, lightness to keep easy things. Um, I, I was yet in uh, Egypt, so uh, this idea we could use the Muslim inshallah, as an example of lightness. <laughs> another culture but uh, i like it to be there and uh, if you like i i have um, a quotation from a, a german um, uh, she is um, a mosque i don't know how you say to a, a female must no uh, i can I, I will quote i cannot describe this life i cannot capture it it is definitely every moment. It is like a river that is always the same, but yet never the same at any moment. We humans are also an expression of this true self, but in the rarest moments we are aware of it. We usually experience ourselves as a more or less transient form, separate from other forms of life, rarely realize our true self and true thank you manuela You're welcome all right so thank you for of you for sharing your views on all these points well friends the session is over i would like to thank all the panelists for all the uplifting reflections and inspiring as well as all of you for joining this session. Our next section is the Youth Forum organized by Europe and Africa. You can follow it, if you wish, on YouTube, if you are above 40 years old. All younger participants have received a direct link for the meeting. And thank you all, and take care. Thank you, and Matze. Dear sisters and brothers, thank you for staying with us. We hope that you are taking the essence of all the sessions. And now we are going to share with you the videos of headquarters of TS in Paris, Helsinki and Kitwe. Thank you.
Thank you all for being with us. And we are happy to share with you the videos and photographs of Theosophical Centers all around the world, which gives a sense of brotherhood to everyone. The next program, that is the Youth Forum for Europe and Africa, Living in the Now, will start from 2 p.m. GMT. I repeat, 2 p.m. GMT that can be viewed live on YouTube. And those young delegates who have received the Zoom meeting link for the Youth Forum can attend or join the Youth Forum directly through Zoom. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. See you soon.
greetings everyone uh, we are Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are now closing this session because uh, very soon we will be starting the youth forum, which you can attend uh, through the Zoom link if you are under 40 or through the uh, YouTube channel of the Theosophical Society also. We will be going live. Uh, then we will go back at 5 p.m. GMT. We will start our next webinar of the convention. Thank you. Thank you very much and see you soon.